so I live in a baddish kind of neighborhood. You know, nothing too bad goes on, but there are definitely some weird slimy things going on. This is like a story in progress, maybe? I don't know yet, but let's get to the story. My house is next to others like most neighborhoods. I have a house on both sides of me. One is my friend's aunt, and the other is this family of I think five or six. I don't know, I see plenty of people come and go from there. Well, one day I my dad came to pick me up from my girlfriend's house, and on the way back he told me that my neighbor, I don't know his name, but we'll call him Greg. So he told me he seen Greg coming into our backyard through this like woodsy separation between our two houses. The creepy thing is, is that my dad's girly friend's daughter was in the backyard by herself. My dad told me he was watching her through the window while doing dishes and then look up to check on her and he sees Greg crossing the woodsy separation right where she was. He went out there and asked him what's up and Greg responded, Oh, I seen her out here alone. I was just going to ask her if she was okay. Blah, blah, blah. My dad tells me to keep an eye out for anything odd cause Greg does seem kind of creepy. I've never seen him with a shirt on and I think I've only seen him leave his house like twice both times with no shirt on. But I'm not quick to judge, maybe he was being a good guy and was concerned. So a couple weeks go by after my dad telling me to watch out and says he's seen him at the gas station by our house and he said hey and made some small talk. My dad told Greg that he straight up didn't like him near the house. My dad also told Greg that if he ever comes by the house when no adult is around, because I babysit my dad's girlfriend's daughter and my little brother that I may know where the pistol is, and I earned a black belt in karate I have, and that he better not mess with us. I thought what my dad did was a bit harsh, but I trust my dad's judgment and I keep an eye out. Nothing too weird, but if I see him I'll make sure he's a safe distance away, but whatever. Well, today, August 28, 2020, I was playing basketball around 8 p.m., so it wasn't too dark to not play, but it was pretty dark. But since I play on the street, he can see me right through his window if the blinds are open. And guess what? The blinds are wide open, and he's looking right at me. We make eye contact, and he turns away, quickly acting like I didn't just see him watching me. But I keep playing to see if he does it again, and sure enough, I see him staring at me like WTF. Anyways, I'm not sure whether to tell my dad or what because I could be exaggerating it, but I could have swore he was looking dead at me. I will write an update post if anything happens, but for now we shall wait. Okay, so this just happened and I'm still freaked out. If I'm overreacting, please let me know, but I'm still shaking typing this. I live in a small, small, small town. I'm a psalm with a 10-month-old son, and I frequently go on runs through town, go to the park, go to the library, or just go on long walks to get us out of the house. Never had any issues other than making friends with neighborhood dogs that I can't take home. Now we have four sets of neighbors. Two are normal, we know one family well, and the other we simply wave every now and then, but the other two seem to have substance abuse issues, and we've had problems before, but never with this guy I'm talking about in particular. One of those neighbors with the substance abuse problems has an adult son who lives with them, and doesn't seem to have a job since he is home most of the time. Ever since we moved here, he has had a staring problem like watching me garden or play with my dogs or really anything. I pretty much have ignored it and tried not to freak out about it, because maybe he just has a mental illness or something, and he's never approached me. Today my son and I went to the library and the park. On the way there I noticed him standing next to a truck in a parking lot connected to the sidewalk we were on. He and the person in the truck were talking and looking at me as I walked past. I didn't catch anything they said. But I got this really, really uncomfortable feeling with how the situation felt and got to the library as fast as I could so more people would be around. I calmed down, told myself I was being silly and got some more books. After that we went to play at the park for a bit and noticed them still in the parking lot staring over at the park. After spending as much time as humanly possible at the park with my baby, I finally bit the bullet and started off home. I was there maybe 45 minutes total. Here's where I started to feel the chaste feeling. I had to walk past them again. As soon as I passed them, the guy started walking after me. 
He had a coat on with the hood up, it's 70 degrees here today, and was walking with his hands in his pockets and head down. I felt sick to my stomach, but I kept telling myself that I was being paranoid, and that I was terrible for judging him, and I needed to chill out. I got to the railroad tracks I have to cross and had to wait for a school bus to pass, and during that time he got much closer. I could feel my heart in my throat at this point because once I cross the tracks it isn't a busy area anymore, strictly residential, and I didn't see anyone else out and about. I purposely went one road too far over so I could see the road I usually walked down and turned and waited. I saw him come down the street, look up, stop, look around, and then slowly start walking again once he saw me walking parallel to him on the street over from him. When I slowed down he slowed down. I stopped, turned around and went back to the road. I usually go down so that I was now behind him. He kept walking really slow and when he saw that I was no longer next to him on that street, or he could have been checking for cars on a very non-busy, half-gravel road, he walked through the alley, which is really just the grassy area between our yard and our neighbor's yard into his yard. I call my husband because I'm uncomfortable. I ask him to just stay on the phone with me while I get into our house, and when I turn to back step into our side door with my son's stroller, I see him staring at me from the corner of their yard talking on his phone. After standing around in his yard for maybe three minutes, he walks back into town without his hood on. I've tried to be understanding of the staring, but that situation really freaked me out. Maybe I'm looking into things, maybe previous abusive situations I've been in have made me paranoid, I don't know. But I don't like how he made me feel, and I'm now carrying a pocket knife with me when I go on my walks and runs. Edit or update. I spoke with my neighbors who confirmed the suspicions of mental illness they know his family because again, small town, although I am not aware of the type severity of it. I really hope he gets help and this doesn't continue any further. Later on that day, once my husband was home, we were outside gardening, and he came out to watch us for a little bit but since he was still in his yard, we couldn't do anything about it. I'm not the best storyteller, so bear with me. I was a college student female who lived right off campus in a duplex type house. The house was split into an upper space where me and two other girls lived and lower space where two guys lived. In the summer, my mom and grandma came to help me move my stuff into the house and the guys below me came up to introduce themselves. One of them was very nice and offered for us to use their Wi-Fi until we got our own. I could tell from the get-go the other guy was socially awkward. I don't know if he had any disorders like autism. I learned he was not a student, but just living near the college for some reason. Once I moved most of my stuff into the house, I went back to my hometown with my mom and grandma until the semester started. Two days into the fall semester, I was at work while my roommates were at home. The socially awkward kid knocked on our door and asked if he could do a load of laundry at our place since his washer wasn't working. My roommates were reluctant to let him in but eventually agreed while being cautious. My roommate told him that once he put his stuff in the wash, he could go home and she would come get him when it was done. He left and came back about 20 minutes later when the wash normally takes about 40 minutes and basically let himself in the house when she opened the door. Both of my roommates were slightly nervous at this point and sat in the living room with him while they waited for his wash to be done. This is where it gets weird. At first they were having normal conversation. But then he started asking about their schedules. Like, do you work? When are your classes? Do you like to work out? When would you usually go to work out? My roommates gave short, non-detailed answers or tried to change the conversation. His wash finally finished and since my roommates were freaked out, they told him they had to go to their sorority chapter and that he could let himself out after he gets his laundry. The girls go upstairs to their rooms to grab their belongings and come out to the hallway to see him upstairs trying to open a spare bedroom door that was locked. My roommates scream and he runs out of the house. My roommates immediately went to the police station and they couldn't really do anything since they had let him in the house. They said he was probably trying to steal from us, but we had very minimal things in the house since we had all just moved in. We didn't even have a TV at that point. 
We never spoke to him again after that, but we would often see him lingering around, walking around the house, sitting by himself, staring off into the distance, just doing really off-putting stuff. Like he would literally stare at nothing for a good hour. It was the weirdest shit. I don't know what his intentions were, but it scared the shit out of us for sir. Oh, and by the way, my phone had died while I was at work, so I came home to my roommates gone and didn't realize what had happened until my phone was charged. Growing up, we lived across the street from another family that we became close friends with. I was about 15 at the time and I had a crush on their younger son, so I was over there a lot. His dad would always invite my sister and I over, and we'd pretty much just hang out. Eventually, I would babysit the older sister's daughter, so I was over there a lot more. There would be times when we would be outside riding bikes or what have you, and we'd notice someone watching us through their kitchen window. Never thought anything of it since the window was in front of their house and our house faced theirs. Then the invites from my crush's dad started to come in. Movies, hiking, trips into the city, amusement parks, college plays, concerts, and he'd always pay. It was always my sister, a few girlfriends, and myself alone with this guy. At the time, we never thought anything of it. We were neighbors. There was one night where my sister and I were staying at our girlfriend's house a few blocks away. It was about 2 a.m. and we got the brilliant idea to play Truth or Dare. My girlfriend and I of course chose Dare, and we were dared to run down the street topless. Their house wasn't located in an area where we would have to worry about being caught or seen. We work up the courage to finally go for it, and we all go outside and wouldn't you know it. My crush's dad, our neighbor, was parked across the street. The topless running never happened. I will never forget his face when he realized that we noticed him. We approached him a little off guard and asked why he was there. He said he was just out going for a drive, but danced around the question of how he knew we were all there. After that, so many things started to fall into place about how he was with us. After that night, we started to keep our distance from him. I stopped seeing his son and eventually stopped babysitting. To this day, I still think, holy F, at any time he could have assaulted us. As much as I try to forget about the night we busted him stalking us, I can't. I can't even shake the possibility of him jerking one out as we were outside. Now that we're older and my sister and I look back on it, all we can think is, why didn't we realize any of that sooner? A lot of what it's and why's. He still lives in the same house, but my family have all recently relocated out of state. When I was eight, something strange happened to me, but I can't remember all the details very well. I'm female and I used to live in a condo in Montana at that time. We all shared a backyard and were friends with our neighbors. In December, there were big piles of snow about five feet tall next to our driveway from shoveling, and I had fun sledding down those snowy hills. In our old neighborhood, there were a bunch of kids, mostly between five and ten years old, except for one older kid named Robin, not his real name, for privacy. Robin was 14, way older than the rest of us. He didn't come outside much, but when he did, I noticed he was really aggressive and mean to all the younger kids. He would slam into kids and even make fun of them for not being strong. I didn't see him much because, as I said before, he didn't come out of his house much, so I didn't really talk to him a lot. Robin was okay with me, but not so nice to the boys in our neighborhood. Because he was older, he kind of thought he was better than us, if that makes sense, sort of like the leader. He acted like he was better than everyone. I didn't like bumping into him much, but one night I stayed outside later than usual, building an igloo with all the snow from the driveway. I was trying to knock the ice off the gutters when I saw him coming towards me. I was a bit annoyed because I was outside at night just to be by myself, but I didn't make a big deal out of it. Soon he came up and started talking. He showed me how to knock the ice off. I said thanks, grabbed my sled, and showed him my snowy hill. I don't exactly remember how we got to this topic, but he started talking about random stuff he did, like kissing girls and other things, even in school bathrooms with other people. It made me feel weird, but I just kept sledding down the hill and listening. Then he went behind the little hill where I slid down. He started walking around and said, 
Hey, I have a question. But before I could answer, he quickly said, Actually, never mind. For some reason, I didn't think it was strange, and it makes me want to slap myself now when I think about it. But I still asked, No, tell me. He kept going in circles for almost a minute, saying he couldn't or it was too dirty for me. Then he finally said, Okay, fine. I was going to say, let's play a game of rock, paper, scissors. If I win, we have to kiss, but if you win, we don't have to unless you want to. I got really scared because he was twice my age. I just sat there feeling shocked for what seemed like a long time, but was actually only three seconds. Thankfully, I came up with an idea and said, wait, hold on, I have to get something. I jumped up and ran to my door. I closed it a bit and sat there for about 10 seconds, not sure what to do. I didn't feel safe outside anymore, so I went back out and told him I had to go inside because my mom said it was too late, even though that wasn't true. Surprisingly, he just said, okay, and we said goodbye. I went inside and sat near my mom, who was working on her computer. Now I feel anxious, which makes this situation even harder. At first, I thought if I told my mom, I might get in trouble for asking him about what he said. But after sitting there for a while, I decided I should tell her. I can't keep things to myself because I talk a lot. I thought she'd yell at me and get mad, but she just turned to me with a worried look and seemed very surprised. That made me feel better because I was really scared. In the next few days, I had to talk to some police officers about it. He moved a few months later, and I'm sure it was to start fresh and get away from problems. I get why this might not seem scary to others, but it was really scary for me as an eight-year-old with anxiety. Plus, I always felt uneasy around him as his presence was uncomfortable from the beginning. I'm sorry I can't remember all the details well because it happened a long time ago, but parents, please listen to your child if they say something like this, and always be careful about who you talk to. My neighbor across the hall, I kind of feel like I'm the kid in one of those movies where the kid knows something's going on, but has literally no proof so nobody's taking them seriously. At first I thought he had OCD and it was ritual for him to try the door three times after locking it our apartment doors only come with deadbolts when leaving. But then I'd hear his door being tried despite being locked at completely random times. I've looked through the peephole only to see his door is closed, and he's nowhere to be seen, but they're still pulling on the door like someone's trying to open it despite being locked. We only ever see him in passing, and the few times I've said hello he never says it back and starts hurrying to get into his apartment. While his door's been open, there's no furniture at all, none. But he's got stuff blocking the windows to avoid letting light in, and I hear the noises all the time. 2 a.m. noises. 10 a.m. noises. 3 p.m. noises. No rhyme or reason to the noises. I would not be surprised if it turned out he's holding someone prisoner in his apartment or something. I've had a murderer, a gang member, and a house of what I suspect were drug dealers in my neighborhood. The drug dealers weren't so bad. It was just weird seeing their transactions at 2 a.m. The worst thing about them was their mean-ass dog. He was aggressive to the point of running up into my garage to intimidate my dad. The murderer I never interacted with. He lived down the street. He and a friend attempted to rob someone via Craigslist and it went sideways. They killed a guy over a car. The night it happened, there were loud bangs at around 11.30. Turns out the police tracked them down, and we were hearing them throwing flashbangs so they could get him. The gang member was in some motorcycle gang. My family actually knew him and his family fairly well. My dad was friendly with him, going off the assumption that being almost friends would keep us safe. And also they had nice, adorable dogs. But the police were at that house probably three times a month. The family moved out suddenly when the guy was hospitalized from an accident. And this is a standard middle-class neighborhood. We are by no means in a bad part of town. Well, except for those three houses. It was Christmas Day circa 2020-ish. As in tradition, it was the yearly Christmas snowstorm, so we stayed home. 
I live in an okay part of a city east of Cleveland in an apartment at the time. We hear a frantic banging on the door and other neighbors' doors. There was a male mid-20 to 30s saying someone had a gun was looking to s assault and shoot a white woman on our floor. We were the only white people on our floor for context, no one answered their doors or anything. But the crazed guy said he would be back in case the rapist comes. I thought he was already outside the door. I saw him another time standing outside my neighbor's door a couple months later, and he was asking who lived there, and I told him just some people I don't know and I lived alone and shut my door. It was the last time I saw him, but I will always remember knowing that guy wanted someone to unlock their door so he could get in to do something horrible. Or he was on crack, lots of crackheads out here in Ohio. I was the creepy neighbor. I was 15 and sick and tired of my neighbors constantly waking me up in the middle of the night with their semi-trucks. I decided to stare at them, day in and day out. Wherever they were, there I was. I would creepy stare at them as I walked to school and home. They never complained about me and stopped idling their semi in the middle of the night. I guess my experiment was a success. When I was about 10, this guy used to pee into the flower bed in his front yard every morning right after his wife left for work, probably about 6.30ish in the morning. My mom left for work around 7 and would always see him doing it out of our front room window. The whole family called him the peeing in the yard guy. Different neighbor wanted to kill our cat. It was an elderly lady who absolutely hated our cat, which we occasionally let outdoors. She set up a line of tuna cans leading from the border between our yards into her backyard, straight into a cat trap. After a period of about a day where the cat didn't return, we were getting a little worried until my dad was out doing yard work and heard really pained, weak meowing from the old lady's yard. He climbed on top of the fence to see our cat in the trap and goes to talk to her about it, furious. She refused to let her out until my dad threatened to call the police saying that he was lucky he found her in there before she did, and that the next time she caught the cat in her yard, it was being taken to the pound to be put to sleep. He did call the police after that, but they didn't do anything. Cat stayed indoors 247 following that interaction. TL doctor, dude pees in his front yard every day at the same time. Old lady lures our cat into her yard and threatens to have her killed. the guy currently next door. I was watching his cats while he and his wife were away and on my way out one day noticed the electronic picture frame and waited for the next pic to show. It was a picture of a plaid bikini top from just under the boobs to the bottom of her chin. Then I realized it was my checkered bikini top. I deleted that pic right there and then. His wife left him for another woman and I always keep the blinds closed on his side of my house. there used to be an old lady who lived in the apartment above mine when I was like 12, 13. She would constantly tell me that she personally knew Satan and her arms were covered in scars. Her bedroom was right above mine and sometimes at night I could hear her chanting or some shit. One night she started like screaming and shit. My mom called the cops. I saw them taking her away from my window and never saw her again. I'm 21 now and to this day thinking about her scares me a little. In my old apartment, the girl across the hall was dating this dude that would sit in the shared laundry room and drink all day while she was at work. It was a standard shared laundry room that had a washer and dryer and that was it. But I'd walk in there and he'd just be sitting on the dryer with a bottle of vodka. Nice enough guy, I guess. He would move if I asked him to. But I had enough when I had to start emptying out the bottles from the trash can in there, so it didn't stink like liquor. They ended up breaking up and he went to rehab, I think. But he showed up at her place one day, and she had to call the cops to drag him out of there. I remember just down my street near the curve there was a lady that lived in her house with a small dog. Nice green yard, freshly painted blue fence. 
Never paid much attention to her as a kid when does a kid ever think about the danger of things in their proximity. I was outside on a sunny day playing cops and robbers with a few mates, and then bam in under ten minutes two police cars pull around the corner to stop at the house. At that point I had no image in my head besides the idea of living in a jail cell for the rest of my life. She then proceeded to rant and scream about shootings and of a possible robbery. The situation was quickly diffused by the police who took a look at us and just left but I never really understood the power of a nine-year-old's imagination until that day I even felt guilty. But yeah, Lady had some issues and Mum made it clear to never go near there again. I had a neighbor who lived two doors down who was a little weird. Nothing out of the ordinary, late 40s, weird vibe kind of thing. He moved away, and then a few years later moved next door to me, with his parents after his marriage broke down. I'd often see him looking outside staring at me while I was taking the dog out on the garden or going out or whatever. The time that made me the most uncomfortable was, another time I was taking the dog on the garden, another neighbor was talking to him, and they started talking about me. I'd recently gone to my prom, so the other neighbor was basically saying, did you see Erin in her prom dress the other night? Yeah, I was watching out the window the whole time while her mum was taking her picture. She looked really nice. I figured they didn't know I was just on the other side of the hedge, but I looked towards the hedge out of the corner of my eye, and he was looking straight at me as he'd answered our other neighbor, and he'd realized I'd looked over. After that, virtually any time I left the house, rather than just look out of the window, He'd open the window and lean out of it and watch me. It's not that creepy, but I was 1A617 and my mom would often go away for days or weeks at a time, leaving me home alone and feeling constantly watched. When my husband and I first moved in together, we were the first tenants of these new townhouses. We purposely chose a middle unit so the cost of heating and cooling would be lower. Our neighbors that moved in on each side of us sucked. On the left we had a couple that were always either fighting or making love. On the right we had people speaking in tongues constantly. We tried our hardest to avoid meeting either of them for a while. The Church of God people were by far the weirder ones. I was multiple times a day that we would hear them speaking in tongues. If they ever had an argument or anything went wrong, we could hear the husband telling his wife that it's happening because she's not as devout as she should be. We finally met them the day before we moved out. The guy was formerly a hairdresser in Florida, but quit his job and moved here because he wanted to be closer to Perry Stone and other Church of God people. Well, my husband is an electrician and he happened to be working on wiring up Perry Stone's new TV studio, which was next door to the townhouse. My husband told them that, and the guy got so excited and said he didn't know that was Perry Stone's new place. The next day my husband went to work, and the weirdo neighbor was in there volunteering to do any work they needed. My husband said he showed up every day until the job was completed. Edit. He also gave us a huge speech about how the end is near. When I was in grad school, I lived in a condo with mostly elderly people as neighbors. My next door neighbor was literally a Holocaust survivor. But down at the other end of the building was this guy I literally called Creeper. He was a divorced father of two who worked for a delivery company. He was a ginger guy with a soft yet deep voice. I'm not sure he ever actually worked and was always either drunk or stoned. When I would walk my dog around the building at night, he would occasionally be sitting outside his back door without any lights on, just sitting. I'd be walking around the building and all of a sudden he'd say something and scare the shit out of me. He was also one of those gun owners who frequently talked about their paranoid delusions about how he hoped someone would try and break into his condo so he could shoot them. Something was very off with him. one of my current neighbors. He's a retired orthodontist who is odd. My wife can hear him. She works at home walking around in his backyard on his cell phone, having conversations about they and them as in that's what they want you to believe and so on. 
asks his wife has left him a few times and then come back, and one time when she was leaving she was screaming at him from the driveway. I know what you're up to, John. I know what you're hiding. I know you don't want me to, but I'm going to tell everyone what I know. My wife and I get the sense that he's a doomsday prepper or something. There was this guy that lived around the corner from me. Seemingly normal guy had the most immaculate lawn in town. I would see him every weekend meticulously grooming his front lawn, and he was known in the area as the guy that's crazy over landscaping. Turns out the guy was also crazy over children. The guy was arrested for being a pedophile. Had thousands of Polaroid pictures of underage boys stashed in the floorboards of his house and thousands more stored on his computer. Scary enough, only six months prior to his arrest, I was riding my bike home from a friend's house and passed him. He asked me if I could help him move a sleigh from his garage to the front lawn. Looking back on it, I'm thankful that I was a bigger 15-year-old kid and could have taken this guy because only God knows what would have happened if I was any smaller. I just found out two days ago that the man who lived two houses down from me growing up was recently arrested for making CP in his basement. He had a whole setup of cameras, etc., and was s assaulting little boys and uploading it online. He also had hundreds of other CP videos on his computer, so that was a shock. There was always this guy sitting in his car in the driveway at that house. Like every time I walked by as a kid, he was just sitting in there. But my mom said that was his brother. Not sure about that one. When I was three, I was jumping rope on my driveway. My neighbor didn't like me doing that, so he came over and tied me up with my jump rope. It was so tight I couldn't scream, but my dad finally walked outside the saw me, called the police. I don't think he was arrested, I just remember my dad yelling at him. After that, they started leaving chocolate balls near where we let our dog out. His wife was soon arrested for burning a kid in the sink while running an illegal daycare out of their garage. He was eventually arrested too for something else, but possible for tying me up. I was three so I'm no sure, I just remember watching them take him away in handcuffs from my other neighbor's window. This was 22 years ago, and I found out recently that the guy died of cancer not too long ago, and shortly afterwards his wife and son we both stabbed to death by his brother. The only one who is still alive is the daughter, and I think she was pretty normal. This was in an upper-middle-class gated community. Creeps are everywhere. Edit. So I found the news report on it. I didn't want to link to it because it has names, so I just cut it out and blanked out identifying info. But it's not so hard to find, so I don't really care that much. Apparently it was related to the tying. And apparently I hit him with it. Don't remember that. My old neighbor and his wife were weird. They would watch us through the windows with binoculars. How do we know? They told us. Other than that they weren't too creepy. Until years later they got divorced and he started stalking her. Just driving past her house hours on end. When I was in college I got a phone call about old creepy. One Friday evening some government cars, maybe D, raid his house and take all this shit, boxes and a computer and such. My parents told me he spent Saturday burning things all day. Sunday morning he goes down to the church his wife works at to murder her, shoots her point blank in the pew. The other members of the congregation tried to stop him. While he threatened them, he didn't hurt anyone else. He just killed her and sat in his car until the police showed up. It was never disclosed why, but the theory was he was involved in distributing CP and had killed her in some attempt to silence her. house next to us has been occupied by two family assaulters and an Asian restaurateur who kept chunks of mystery meat drying on a lot of clothesline. One abuser took it out on his wife, ending in an incident on the front lawn that brought police intervention. The other was an Air Force sergeant who took it out on his two kids don't know about the wife. The girl compensated by eating. The boy played with matches until he set an adjacent vacant lot on fire and the fire department intervened. 
Oh, the mystery meat. Can't say, but we have prairie dogs in the neighborhood. When I was a kid, the school weirdo and his weird twin sister lived next to me. His family was all ginger and pretty inbred looking. We'd constantly hear shrieking from inside the house. The daughter would stand outside and scream at the neighbor's dogs to stop barking for like hours straight. Then she'd stroll her baby doll around the neighborhood keep in mind she was 15. A generally accepted rumor was that the twin son and daughter were messing each other on the reg. Last I saw of them, the parents had arranged a marriage between the daughter and some 40-year-old dude. Our current next-door neighbor for sure. When we first moved in, after like six months, he had developed a bit of a crush on my mum. He is a single 45-ish man. One day we heard loads of banging from his garage, which was odd, he's usually silent. The banging carried on for a couple of days, and when it stopped he came round and asked for my mum when I answered the door. My mum came out to him, and he lead her into his garden where he showed her an outdoor elaborate birdhouse he had made for her. Now I want to add at this point that my mum Wasi's married with three kids. She told him that she couldn't accept his gift as she felt it would be inappropriate, but it was a lovely sentiment. He has got her other smaller gifts over time and is pretty lecherous around my mum, but he seems pretty harmless and my dad can handle himself and sleeps with a meat cleaver under the bed so I think we'll be fine. My current neighbor is either insane or on drugs. He sits in his front yard all day blaring salsa music and screaming at the top of his lungs in gibberish. Every now and then he'll randomly walk into our house. We've caught him several times in our living room just standing there and looking around. We're not the only one he does this to. He never steals anything, though. Not too long ago he went into our neighbor's house when they weren't home and flooded the whole first floor by turning on all the sinks and bringing in their hose turned on from the backyard. He literally had no reason for doing it. He's actually closest to them than anyone on the street. I have quite a few. A couple of guys who were roommates next door when I was maybe four randomly gave me a hamster. That thing was mean. I fed it to the cat cause it bit me. I was four. My mom was also the neighborhood mom. We lived in a poor area so many kids would come to our house and eat. One girl came to our house and would always eat. Her name was Rosie. I am sure she had been severely abused and neglected she ended up killing her mom. She lived a few houses down. She always lied and was very mean. I was around five or six when she would come up. She was around seven or eight. She was a teen when she ended up killing her mom. Another lady who lived next door with her husband and two little girls. Apparently any time the girls got sent over the parents were going apeshit on each other. The mom was mentally ill. She ended up shooting herself in the foot and claimed the husband did it. He had just happened to make it there as the cops come in, and he had a receipt from an auto parts store THR same time she called the cops. I legit didn't like this lady. She ended up killing herself a few years after they divorced. He got the girls in THR divorce. We had a guy that lived next to us they would always come over and try crap with my mom. She was single at this point and she may be small, but she can handle herself. This guy was always drunk. He had that mega creeper vibe. He would knock all hours of the night to try to get in. She kept me around if he managed to get in I was 12, but I was 150 pounds and taller than him. I was more intimidating than her, but she would have totally messed this guy up while I would have just called the cops. Guy across the street was in his 30s, but he was attracted to just turned 18 girls. He did get physical with a local ice cream truck guy for trying lure a 16-year-old handicapped girl in his truck, so he wasn't all bad. He did like to make a bunch of sexually inappropriate jokes in front of my sis and I. He married some 18-year-old chick and then they got into a fight and she threw old chili in his Camaro and left after two weeks. He was weird and definitely bordering on pedo. A girl that lived next door was mentally handicapped and my dad was good friends with her dad. 
She would come outside at noon and just start ranting to the air about anything and everything going a mile a minute. If she wasn't ranting, she was yelling at made-up people about made-up situations. It was like a soap opera via radio. You could barely understand her. She was probably in her 20s. She would just walk in a circle and yell. Her dad was always working and her mom was probably mentally ill too. I never saw much of her. She never got angry with anyone around. She never yelled in the house, just outside in the driveway walking in a circle. It was weird the first couple of days, then you got used to it. I still see her dad from time to time. I always say hey and give him a hug. I was 14 when we moved into our new home. Neighbor lived next door with his wife and four kids. He was creepy as F and extremely flirtatious with me. Even when I was a minor at the time, I never thought too much about it. Just overall felt weird around him and would keep any encounters with him pretty brief. Fast forward to my late teens, early 20s. I went over there to pick up something, can't remember what it was. He was home alone, I obviously didn't know he was alone, or I wouldn't have gone. He full-on exposed himself to me and began jacking off as he jacked off. He told me he'd watch me through the fence and even told me the color of my nipples WTF. He said he'd look through the fence after I'd get out of the shower and he's watch me change in my room. Must have been 16 at the time he said he was watching me. I was shocked I couldn't talk. I literally bolted out of his house and never told anyone about the encounter. I had a neighbor who was in high school when I was in elementary school. His dad was a registered S offender, so my parents told us to stay away from his family. I remember something was off about the kid, though. The high school got out before the elementary, so he would get home around 3 and I would around 4. One day I came home and went to the basement to play Barbies or something and heard the TV was on. This kid had broken into my house and was playing Xbox when nobody was home. I have no idea how he even knew where it was. He had never stepped foot in our house. I honestly don't even know how he got in the house. All the doors were locked and the garage was closed. Growing up, my neighbor had this creepy obsession with my dog. One Christmas we heard her freaking out outside, and when we went to go check on her let her in, we found our neighbor leaning over our fence and our dog in a sweater. He said it was her Christmas gift and didn't think she would hate it. Another year we went camping and left my grandmother in charge of our dog. When my grandma stopped by our house to check on our dog, she couldn't find her. We were close to home when she called us so she started searching the neighborhood before we got there. When we got home the first thing my dad did was ask the neighbor if he saw her get out. What was my neighbor's response? He thought our dog was lonely while we were camping so he decided to take her from our yard and put her in his yard. Thankfully he stopped all this after we got the police involved. Not so much a neighbor. He lives nearby though. I don't know what's wrong with him except his has Tourette's. Apologies constantly for it. He hadn't even said anything random or twitched and apologized twice to me. But that's not what makes him creepy. He comes up to anyone and everyone, shouting across the street and at himself in the middle of the road. Stands outside his little house and waits for someone to pass. Usually in welly boots, shorts, and a t-shirt filled with holes and messy hair. He weirded me out because usually I sit at the bus stop and I might have the odd person ask when the next is due or how long have I been there. But him, no no. How old are you? Do you like my socks? They're semen socks. Do you have any socks? Can I come to your house and borrow them? Where do you live? I like you. How old are you? Can I kiss you? He had been speaking to me for about five minutes. He didn't even know my name and I'd say he's about twice my age. Avoided that stop for months. Saw him again the other day. I haven't seen you around lately. I'm sorry. You're quite shy. What happened? Nice day today. Where are you going? Do you still like me? I've got Tourette's. Also heard he has stared at a pregnant woman on the bus. Asked her how the baby got in her belly and then waited to get off the bus at the same stop as her and follow her home, 
though my nan went with her and he eventually left. Did the same to someone who lived across the road from me and police came and took him away. I do wonder what's wrong, maybe autism or something. One of my current neighbors. I moved into this flat about a month ago and have come across three of the other four neighbors on my floor, either just passing in the corridor or had a parcel delivered to their flat when I wasn't in. But the guy next door I hear him grunt and sigh occasionally, which is how I know they're a he never seen. I don't work currently, I have an ongoing illness, so I'm in most of the time, but I've never heard his front door go to suggest that he's exiting or entering. Nor do I hear anyone go round, even though these are small flats and I can hear my neighbor on my other side coming and going, as well as the postman knocking on everyone else's doors. Assuming his flat is the same floor plan as own, his bedroom shares a wall with my living room. When I'm sitting on my sofa, I can hear creaking kinda like a mattress or creaky bed frame through the wall, on and off at all times of the day. So, a man is definitely alive in there, but what does he do in bed all day? My immediate thought is that he is also disabled, but how is he getting food? And if he's bed-bound, who is caring for him? The first house my parents owned, into which I was born, was in a rather nice area, but happened to be next to an outlier. A halfway house that had come about through a noble but misguided bequest. By and large, the guys all men who came through in the time my parents were next door were, I'm told, very good sorts. They were basically good people who had made mistakes, paid their debts to society, and were absolutely thrilled to be living in such pleasant surroundings. It was run, Ewerk, strictly on a referral basis, so that only parolees who were ready and suited for this kind of environment were sent there. It wasn't a very professional operation, just a place for decent guys coming out to live and adapt back into good society. Then a guy with a rather darker past, but fairly promising social skills managed to wangle a referral. He was only there for about a couple of months when I was barely a year old, but my parents said they were immediately on their guard around him. Then the body of a little girl not much older than me showed up in the lane way between the houses. New guy went away for a long, long time, my parents moved, and the halfway house was shut down. When I was a kid around eight years old, I lived in a somewhat sketchy neighborhood. Many of the houses were trailers perched on top of hollow concrete foundations, and the real houses needed some repairs. One day, a new neighbor moved in. She was a couple of years younger than me and for privacy's sake, I'll call her Ellen. She constantly joined in on whatever I was doing and came over to see if I was around without any warning. There weren't many nice kids in the neighborhood, so I understood to an extent where she was coming from. However, she didn't seem to share the same idea of fun. A lot of my memories from that time are somewhat fuzzy, but here's what I remember. Ellen was very aggressive. She would get angry if I ever told her no, and almost every time I visited her house, I could hear her screaming at her parents and later her dog. She was generally very loud and seemed to enjoy making me flinch. I've never been a fan of loud voices when they're unnecessary. I would also find things missing from my room, only to see them in hers. Items like friendship bracelets, stones I had found, and small toys littlest pet shop anyone. Whenever I pointed them out, she would go silent and let me take them back, staring at me as if I had wronged her somehow. She unnerved me, to be honest. When we went frog hunting, there were a few times she pulled the legs off our frogs, and her dog seemed scared of her. I'm almost sure they took it to a shelter, so I really, really hope it's okay now. I'd also sometimes find dead birds and squirrels on my front steps, their legs, heads, or wings missing. They were all over her yard too, but she blamed her cat. I never saw a cat, and I remember hearing a couple of different names for it. I can't be sure it was her, of course, but a little voice in my head thinks so. My cat definitely killed mice too, but she never did it so brutally before or tore off any pieces. She'd run into my mom sometimes when she was looking for me, 
and my lovely mother told me she had asked to come in anyway and wait in my room when I wasn't there. The answer was always no, for pretty obvious reasons. Our fence to the backyard was high, and there was no way to climb it which I learned the hard way after the gate locked behind me, home alone with locked doors and no key. It was about six feet tall, made of nice new wood, with a latch only on the backyard side. Our trash and recycling bins were about 10-15 feet away by our front shed. We started finding them right against the fence and eventually my mom caught Ellen peeking over the fence when she was out back cleaning our little pool. I also found Ellen lurking by the fence coming home from school one day when she was supposed to be sick. So being around her always gave me a horrible feeling, as if doing something wrong or mentioning what I'd caught her doing would lead to something bad happening to me. We moved away about a year and a half after she moved in, and I have no idea what has become of her now. I hadn't thought about Ellen in years, but driving past the old neighborhood a while ago brought it all back. I've got plenty of other stories to share, though Ellen won't be making an appearance in them. I'm a 22-year-old Brazilian male from a really small town, and in 2018 I moved to the capital of my state for study and work. In these five years, I never had a sight of a creepy encounter or even a robbery, but last Friday I had the worst experience of my life. At the start of 2020, I moved to this apartment complex. I live on the first floor of the first block, which makes the space behind my bedroom window a common area. And in these three years, same thing. All peace, no robbery around, not many people walking behind the place looking inside, except some internet provider technicians and a trustful neighbor who eventually walks behind to make it to his bike faster at the start of the day. People tend to ignore us living inside. They would pass just minding their own business, talking to me only if I was in a different area of the apartment a little porch in our living room. I currently live with two friends from my old town and my girlfriend. Last Friday, one of those friends went back to our town, leaving me, my girlfriend, and the other friend alone in the apartment. So around 3 a.m., me and my girlfriend came home from a bar we like to go to every Friday. At this point, it was all normal. We came, ate something, took a shower, and rolled a blunt like normal couples do. In that time, my friend came home around 3.30 a.m., making the situation even more secure for us, as usual. We invited him to smoke some weed, which he denies because he was tired, so we decided to just smoke and go to my bedroom to have sex. During the deed, we hear some strange noises but end up continuing. In some moment, we want to change the position and hear again the noise of something sliding. So I looked at the windows and saw a guy's face, practically glued to the window bars watching us. I have a very short temper, which leads me into Berserk mode, instantly breaking the window glass with my bare hands. I was really pissed and ran to the kitchen to get a cutting knife while repeatedly screaming, I'm going to kill you. When my adrenaline subsided, I managed to calm down and called my mom to say I was going to stay at her house for a few days in my old town. We are very scared and suspicious of the neighbor upstairs, as we saw him in the same place earlier, and I could recognize scars from freckles on both the window face and the face from earlier. However, without confirmation, we are left in an extremely uncomfortable position, not knowing exactly who the person is and him knowing exactly who we are. He knowing we were going to be late, knowing where we live, etc. It's about the dude. The guy we suspect was seen in the same spot earlier picking up weed ends. He looked into the apartment and chuckled. He's my neighbor upstairs, he doesn't work, he doesn't study, he just listens to music all day, does drugs. As I have insomnia, I can often hear him arranging lines of cocaine and then snorting. I hate the way that shit makes me feel. So my fiancé and I have been on the lookout for a kitten to accompany our three-month-old kitten we have already. We searched and searched until one day he said to me, let's look on Craigslist, so I did. We found the perfect one, but the only problem was it was two hours and thirty minutes away from our home. I inquired about it at around 10.30 p.m. I know it was late. 
but almost immediately I got a response. She sounded very nice over text and asked to see where I lived so that she would feel settled about the kitten living with us. She also insisted on going to their house, I know. I should have just dropped it at the time I thought nothing of it. So I sent them a video we sent up a time for the next day to meet. Next day came I wasn't going to take my fiancé, but he insisted on coming with me because he wanted to be my protection in case since Craigslist is sketchy. So we drove two HRS and 30 men on our way there. As we were on our way I was texting this girl that we would get there on time and she responded, great to see you then. We arrived to the home, me in the driver's seat and my fiancé in the passenger seat with the window down. I texted the girl and I got no response, I called and no response. I ended up calling five times and texting in the course of an hour and no response. I went up to the house and knocked on the door. Nothing. There was a car in the driveway but no response from the number or the door. We got there at 6.30 and waited until almost 8. Nothing. The neighbor came out asking what was wrong. I said I'm here since I inquired about a kitten and she said, a kitten? I said, yes it was an ad on Craigslist. She said, no one has kittens in this home though. I showed her the ad and she said, oh, I know them. They are very sketchy people and they don't own any cats. I just helped them move their furniture yesterday. So I said, well on their ad it says that they have to get rid of their kittens since their new place doesn't allow pets. So the neighbor said, that's impossible. I have a dog and so does the next door over. I immediately found this creepy and assumed the neighbor was also in on something since it was too creepy and I was feeling anxious. I thanked her and left along with my fiancé. Literally immediately when we pulled out of the street I got a text from the girl saying, I'm just now getting your messages, something must be wrong with me phone. Did you still want the kitten or no? I didn't answer and we headed back home. What I don't understand is they didn't get any money from me. But they asked me to show up not knowing I'd be with my fiancé. I had a bad feeling about it. What did they want from me? I've never only started thinking about this in the last 10 to 15 years, but I think I narrowly escaped being s assaulted a or murdered as a kid when I was a preteen growing up in rural Texas. A family from Las Vegas moved next to us. It was Harry, his real name, and his wife, her mother, two daughters, and one of their husbands. I was drawn to them because they were very friendly and interesting. All except Harry. It didn't take long to figure out that everyone in the family hated him. He gave off a real dirtbag vibe. The family had money, but it came from his wife's side of the family. He didn't really fit in with the rest of them. Over a year or so, I spent more and more time over there, but avoided Harry like the plague. Talking to his stepdaughters, I learned that their mother was getting ready to divorce him. I think he could see the writing on the wall too. One day out of the blue, he stopped over at my house. I was outside riding my bike or something. He asked me if I wanted to take a ride with him to check on their cattle. For some stupid reason, I forgot all of my misgivings about him. I thought it might be cool to take a ride with him out in the country to check on the livestock. My mother was inside talking to a friend on the phone. I'll never forget how she reacted when I asked her if I could go with him. Without interrupting her conversation, she mouthed no and shook her head to reiterate the point. She told me to just go to the front door and shake my head, rather than going outside and telling him I wasn't going. Harry just shrugged and left. After his wife finally kicked him out, Harry started harassing them in weird ways creeping outside their house at night and even calling in fake obituaries for one of the daughters into the local newspaper. Thankfully he took off back to Vegas soon after. After I had kids of my own, I started thinking about that incident and what could have happened to me that day if my mother hadn't had the foresight to tell me I couldn't go. I think Harry would have hurt me just to get back at his family members who had a fondness for me. It's chilling to think about. Leaving my friend's house, I accidentally backed into a brick mailbox. My bike rack hit the mailbox so my car was okay, but completely demolished the mailbox. No big deal, right? 
That's why we have insurance, right? I went to the neighbor and told them what happened, and gave them my insurance, phone number, and name. All I got was his first name. From the get-go, this dude was creepy. He kept hitting on me, trying to date me, specifically trying to feed me. I left on my drive to my mom's I'm attending out of state college and parents are divorced the guy I backed into Robert began to text me and call me. He was insistent that it was better for both of us to just pay out of pocket for the mailbox, sending me links to companies that could fix it for $500 and demanding I go on a date with him so I could give him the cash for the repair and he could feed me. I don't know what his deal with the food was. I declined everything but started to get annoyed by his constant texts and calls. Finally, after two days of it with my responses only, please contact my insurance. I sent him a text saying that he was harassing me. I blocked him, but he made a new number and threatened to report it as a hit and run to the police. I'm in law school okay, this wasn't a hit and run. I blocked the second number. Then he used a new number to ask me if I wanted him to send a screenshot or video of the accident to his insurance. I admit, this made me angry I called this number and dug my nails so hard into my thigh I drew blood as he threatened reporting things, asking me on a date, and trying to entice me to just pay cash. I finally screamed, don't contact me again, you f inbred piece of s. My dad heard me and was upset I said that to someone I was in an accident with, and that I said that to a guy who thought I was cute and just wanted a date. I blocked the third number. Next day, he reaches out again to tell me I gave him the wrong policy number. I told him I didn't. He then said it'd be easier to pay cash, that I was the problem, etc. He was talking to his insurance, I guess, and began trying to validate my info. He had my mom's name, address, and phone number. I verified it, told him to not contact me again, and blocked his new number. Next morning, super early, I get a text, basically saying he finished the claim and I was awful for making it harder than it needed to be by going through insurance and not going on a date with him. He then included, You're so beautiful and ugly at the same time. Don't take risks, stay on the good path. Goodbye. At this point, I got scared. Fifth number blocked. Then at midnight, he texts, You up. I know where you live. Don't try and screw me over on insurance. I'll report it as a hit and run. You should have just gone on a date with me. I took the phone to my dad, showed him the texts, and filled him in. My dad, a pretty scary dude, then calls the guy. He answered, Shoot, I knew you were into me. Want to come over? My dad got very mad. My dad said this was beyond harassment. This was his final warning to not contact me, that we didn't care how he reported it, etc. Robert began saying I came on to him and offered sex as payment, invited him to my house, and was a horny bee. Instantly blocked, police contacted, insurance notified, all the things. Next day, talk to insurance, protective order filed get another text telling me I shouldn't have involved police. Block 7th number, notify police, go to stay at my dad's because dude doesn't have this address. My dad is a very tall, very scary dude who loves his second amendment. Late last night, watching Star Wars with my dad and older brother doorbell rings. Dad goes to see who it is, and it's Robert with a trash bag filled with things I left at his house. I call the police, my dad goes ballistic, all the things. Police come, arrest guy. The bag. Lingerie, a knife, lip balm, and a Dita Von Tess fetish book. Just met with an attorney. Plot twist. Guy doesn't own the house, is an illegal immigrant, is married, and is being deported. I feel awful he's being deported. I genuinely think he wanted to s assault and or kill me. I go back to school in a few days and am so terrified he or someone else will follow me. VTA. I have kept my friend his neighbor informed through whole process. He hasn't reached out to her except for video of me backing into the mailbox. I don't know if an illegal immigrant can be charged with crimes, but he was arrested for stalking, trespassing, felony assault he tried to push my dad and then spit at him, insurance fraud he lied about the accident to his insurance agent. 
possession of a deadly weapon with intent the knife in the bag and attempted breaking and entering. They just kept adding on the charges, lol. After college, I moved a lot, so it took me some time to figure things out. And finally, after a few months, I rented an apartment. The place wasn't big, it was small but good. However, for me, it was the best thing ever I had. It felt really good because now I had something that was truly mine, and it made me feel proud just when I needed to stay happy. Well, technically, I was renting, not owning, but you know, for that month after paying, it felt like it was mine. I had it all to myself for 30 days. Not everyone understood why this meant so much to me. I lived by myself now and didn't have friends because I didn't want any. My life was easy. Everything was about my job and being by myself. That's all I wanted, so why should I need any friend? But one night after work, I was searching for my keys and my purse. That's when I heard a soft whisper like someone talking. I turned around, but there was no one there, so maybe my ears were playing tricks on me. I kind of pushed away the thought and went inside my apartment. The voice was gone, so I thought it was just me hearing things. I sat on my couch, thinking about what my co-workers said at work, as they often asked why I kept to myself most of the time. Even though I've been working there for more than a year and seven months, I haven't really had a good talk with anyone. Of course I couldn't say to them that I like being by myself and don't really want them around. So I just said to my work buddies that I enjoy thinking a lot. That's it. I even made up some stuff like I write books in my free time and it keeps me busy. They just got the idea that I like being on my own and that was fine with me. Sometimes I'd stay out later than I had to. I'd leave at 2 in the morning and come home really late. It's not like I had a ton of stuff to do, but I just needed that time for myself. Even though people didn't really believe what I told them, nobody asked too many questions. I ran into Paul a few times in the hallway. He's my neighbor. He always had a smile on his face, so I figured he was a pretty happy guy. We chatted a couple of times, but it was just about everyday stuff like what you say to neighbors. But I got a bit friendlier with someone from work when I found out she liked a song from my favorite band. And by friendlier, I mean we talked for five minutes instead of one. We began talking and became fast friends. After a month, I asked Sarah to come over to my apartment. Turns out her roommate needed a place and Sarah didn't have another spot to stay. So even though I wasn't too sure, I said she could stay with me until she figured things out. The next day we got to my place, but when I tried opening the door, I heard those whispers again, just like last time. It gave me a bit of a shiver, but I tried not to let it bother me. Unlike me, Sarah was curious about the sound. Did you hear that? Sarah asked, while we were outside my apartment. Hear what? I asked, pretending like nothing happened. Just listen, she said. So we both waited there. It was again. It wasn't scary or anything. It felt like someone was trying to say something, but we couldn't figure out what it was. I looked at Paul's place and wondered who he was whispering to. I thought he lived alone, but that's the issue. Sarah and I were pretty sure that the whispers were coming from his apartment. We heard those whispers again, but we couldn't understand what they were saying. Your neighbors are strange, she said. We went into my apartment, had dinner, and laughed about silly stuff at work. She asked if I had a boyfriend, and I said, No, I don't. She responded, I kind of thought so, but that's okay. After chatting for a while, we fell asleep on the couch, leaning on each other. I know it might sound strange, but Sarah was one of those folks who made it easy for me to talk. She made me feel at ease and friendly. It brought back memories of a close friend I had in high school named Evelyn, and we were practically like roommates back then. I noticed a bit of Evelyn in Sarah, and it made me feel a bit emotional. Sarah left the next day early in the morning. When we woke up, since I had the day off from work, I thought I'd just chill. There was a knock on my door that brought me back to reality. I thought about not answering for a moment, hoping the person would go away. I had dealt with enough people for one day. Even though Sarah had made a good impression, I felt tired. Talking so much and being around someone for almost 15 hours wore me out. 
but the knocking didn't stop, so I got up and opened the door. It was my neighbor. He seemed upset about something, but I didn't know what it was. Hey, sorry to disturb you, but I wanted to say you were kind of loud with your friend last night. It would be great if you could keep it down next time. I don't like noise. His voice was almost a whisper, similar to the voices I heard last night. He sounded a bit annoyed and upset, that much I could tell for sure. Ah, uh, sorry about that. I'll try to be quieter next time, I said with a smile. I saw a frown on his face turn into a smile right away. Thanks, he said, and then he went back to his apartment. I just shook off the idea that he was acting a bit strange. Sarah and I were actually quiet last night, but it's all good. A whole week went by after that talk. Things stayed pretty much the same. Every day had the usual routine, but it felt a bit off whenever Paul knocked on my door. I felt anxious and uneasy, like there was something watching me from behind, waiting for me to do something not usual. I was sitting at my desk when someone stood by the front door, knocking. I pulled myself off the chair and opened the door, and again it was Paul, but this time he looked strange. His hair was all messy, and his eyes seemed like they might pop out at any moment. Can you please stop all that talking? I can't, I can't focus because of them. I don't know what you're doing, stop it. Paul turned and walked away, leaving me surprised without a chance to reply. The sarcasm was gone now, it was just pure anger. I don't really like being bothered about things I'm sure of, that I thought about telling the landlord about him a few times, but then I remembered he lost his wife and kids, so maybe he's still feeling really sad. But one night, when I came home from work late, opened my door, and heard those whispers again. I was curious about what they were saying this time, so I checked it out. I put my head on the door to his apartment and listened. She killed her. She is evil. I can't do anything because no one would believe. Dennis killed Carla. I quickly moved away from the door. My breathing was fast. My mind told me to run. I wanted to, but I also wanted to find out more. Denise told everyone it was an accident, but I know it's not. She pushed Carla off the cliff and Carla couldn't swim. No, I whispered. It felt like he heard me because the whisper stopped. I heard footsteps coming to the door, so I rushed into my apartment. Denise was my name. Carla was his wife who passed away. Paul knocked on my door. Too scared to do anything, I ran into the kitchen and hid under the table. Denise, can we talk? He called, his voice sounding serious. I was still shaking, scared, and really confused. What should I do? I heard my front door open. I forgot to lock it. Oh no, I felt so dumb. The door squeaked open, and he peeked into the room, looking around carefully before stepping inside. I could see him from my spot in the kitchen, but I knew he couldn't see me because I was hiding low down. There were a bunch of boxes on either side under the kitchen table, giving me cover. I heard the floor creak as Paul stepped into my apartment. I stayed still. I knelt there, scared and frozen under the kitchen table. All of a sudden it got quiet and I couldn't see him anywhere. The next thing I knew, he grabbed the edge of the table I was hiding under and tried to pull it aside. So it was you, right? Paul asked not paying attention to anything else, and his eyes were locked onto mine. What do you want? I asked, trying to move away from him, but I had no place to go. You killed my wife, didn't you? He asked me, with a mix of sadness, anger, and regret in his voice. I shook my head, saying no, but he came closer. Finally, I started moving back, trying to create space between me and this angry man. You said it was an accident, he yelled. Terrified for my life, I was figuring out what to do next as he came closer slowly. My wife didn't deserve to die. You were supposed to protect her. How could you do such a thing? Stop making excuses. Do you think you're some kind of saint? I whimpered at the sound of his voice. His intense stare paralyzed me. I couldn't make any sudden moves. That's why you ran away from your family. You wanted to escape to a place where no one knew what you did but I won't let you. Then Paul picked me up and threw me across the living room. I fell on my side and pain shot through my whole body. I tried really hard to breathe. 
When I sat up, I saw him coming towards me again. Then why did you run away if it was an accident? You shouldn't be here. His words hurt like a sharp knife, stabbing my heart, and I knew he believed every word he said. I had nothing to protect myself with except my hands. I couldn't even fight back if I wanted to. As he came closer, closer, leaning forward, the space between us disappeared. His big hands grabbed my neck, and he started trying to squeeze and bang my head against the wall. With all the strength I could find, I leaned my body into him. I bit his arm until he let go, and I tried to run away, but before I could reach the front door, he grabbed my shirt and threw me into the living room like an empty bottle. But this time, I hit my back on the shelf. I was sure I had a few more broken bones. The pain was too much. I didn't mean to hurt her, I said. She was my best friend, I cried, pretending like I did it. This was my last chance to survive. I was in so much pain, begging him with everything I had to stop hurting me. Paul looked at me, but before he could do anything, I saw him get tackled to the floor. In a split second, I could see in his eyes that he believed me when I admitted and pretended I was the one who killed his wife. I said sorry and used my pain from the broken bones to cry a little more. I didn't recognize who tackled him, but someone else joined and kicked the knife out of his reach. The second guy lifted me off the floor, helped me stand, and pulled my hands behind my back as he guided me out of the apartment. It turns out, since the door was left open, some of the other people who live in the building heard what happened. They heard me screaming, crying, and begging for help. Someone did come to help. Two other guys subdued Paul while I was carried out of my apartment. I could hear groans and grunts as they struggled with him. After that, the medic showed up. Everything became a blur and I was in a lot of pain, so they gave me gas to make the pain go away. My whole body felt numb. I needed several operations because of my broken bones. My neighbor Paul, who acted crazy, was put in a mental hospital. It turns out he had severe problems with his mind, like schizophrenia, delusions, and trouble controlling his. I had a next-door neighbor who was just downright mean. Our house was a double block, so we had the next-door neighbor who was actually next door on the same street, and then another neighbor who we shared a fence with but her house was around the corner. And this lady was just mean. Often I would hear her screaming at her toddler like three, four years old that she is worthless and pathetic. I also had some pet chickens, and I kept the wings clipped but chickens will be chickens and sometimes got over the fence into her yard. Normally I would run around, collect the chook and come home. Like these were pets you would walk up, and they would just look up at you waiting to be picked up and cuddled. One day before I could get around to her house to get the chook, she just let her dog out on it. You could hear the dog ripping this poor little chook to death. It was horrible. In front of her toddler, no less. She then started screaming that if it ever happens again, then she will put the dog into our chicken run to kill all our chooks. We then put a higher bid on the fence. After this incident, I also started using the fence between our properties to practice my hockey serves grass hockey. I mean, I was nine and pissed this lady killed my pet. My mum didn't mind the dents in the fence, and since it was one of those color bond things it made a hella of a noise, which she would have hated since she was a stay-at-home mum, and at her house 99% of the time. So also I had this grumpy old cat, and he went missing. Two weeks later we found him dead in her front yard, all skinny like he had been starved. So yeah, if that lady killed two of my pets. So, this is a story of how I was probably almost as assaulted and never realized it until about 15 years later. We had neighbors up the street, and when I was a kid, their son probably teenage. I honestly don't remember would sometimes come and babysit or keep an eye on me while my parents were out. Not a big deal or a formal thing, but just someone to keep an eye on an 8-year-old for a few minutes. Well, at some point I was telling him about a club that my friends and I from school had, and he started talking about the cooler older kid clubs there were, one of which apparently involved tickling each other's butts. I was kind of weirded out by it, 
but eventually he talked me into tickling his give me a break. I was really young and not even remotely aware of sexuality while he was still dressed as a warm-up sort of thing. I must have mentioned something to my parents about it at some point, because after that I never saw the kid again. It was the kind of thing I randomly remembered like 15 years later during a slow night at work, and realized that if I hadn't said anything or had been just a bit more gullible, I might have had an entirely different childhood. So for any younger Redditors out there, if you've got a neighbor of friend or family member that wants you to do something that feels weird or uncomfortable, just mention it to your parents. Might be nothing or might save your life without realizing it. Mostly the man who kept walking into my driveway to check my inspection stickers on my vehicle so he could report me. He did it on the antique car all the time and I constantly had to remind the complex that no, I am not obligated to explain how antique vehicles work regarding inspection. You as my landlord are responsible for telling him when he calls you every day to report me. The proper response is to not call me when I haven't done anything wrong. I guess he was retired and had nothing better to do. He also followed me home one night, blocked me in my driveway, and told me I wasn't welcome to live here. That was the first night we ever encountered each other. He claimed I was speeding at five miles per hour. MK. At another house, a lady a few houses down was mentally unstable. She threatened another neighbor with a knife screaming about him murdering her plants because he was mowing his lawn. The cops were called nearly every week. I felt really bad for her. She probably needed to be institutionalized or put in a home where she could be supervised. He was mid-thirties, unemployed, lived with his girlfriend in the house next door, and was a tweaker who had been in and out of jail. He was a rabid white supremacist despite acting like a gangsta and listening to rap music 24-7 and had been kicked out of both the KKK and the Aryan Nation because of his drug habit. His girlfriend was half Mexican. He had a KKK logo tattooed on his arm. One time when I was about 12, we came home from vacation. One of our windows broken and he was asleep on our couch. The whole house reeked of a smell like burned cat piss, probably meth. I guess he didn't pay the power bill and didn't have any air conditioning or TV, so he decided it would be a good idea to break in our house and use ours. He didn't steal anything except a few beers and some food out of the fridge, so we decided not to call the cops and my dad just gave him a long talk about getting his shit together and offered to help him get a job, which he declined. That was a mistake. He eventually got a job at Taco Bell and was fired three weeks in for showing up to work high. He tried to sell me and the other neighborhood kids drugs when we were as young as 11, and I guess that was his primary source of income. He had groups of people showing up at his house at all hours of the night and never staying very long, so I suspect they were customers. He went to jail for a while for drug possession when I was about 14, got out about 18 months later, we also suspect he stole cars, since he occasionally had one or two under tarps in his backyard. He probably beat his girlfriend. We never heard it, but she was always covered in bruises. He liked to hang out in his backyard and try to talk to me when I was outside playing or whatever when I was a kid. He also creeped around the local middle school. He'd hang out in the parking lot and whistle at girls and make sexual comments. I thought it was just a little bit creepy when I was 11, 13, but I didn't realize just how messed up it was at the time. There were also occasionally young teenage girls at his house when his girlfriend was at work around that time. He said they were his nieces and tried to get me to come over and play with them, but now I doubt it. Never saw their parents and they were always gone before his girlfriend got home from work. About a year ago, a whole bunch of cops raided his house and took him, his girlfriend, and young woman about 19 or 20 years old who I'd never seen before out in handcuffs. Haven't seen any of them since, don't know what they were arrested for. Most of the trouble neighbors have just been violent, but I guess the creepiest one would be when I was a kid growing up in a block of council flats. 
Our neighbor was a drunk woman who lived with her boyfriend, seemed harmless if completely weird and off her tits on cider at all times. Then one morning me and my little sister have to go to school via the fire escape and the hallway smelled funny, especially around the rubbish chute. Turns out they had turned on each other and she had stabbed him to death before trying to get rid of the body. Luckily my mom was able to use this as fodder to get us into some nicer housing. I was five and he lived down the street from me. It was a longer street so not a direct neighbor, but he was a school teacher who was linked to the murder and abduction of a few kids. I remember coming home to cops everywhere and our street shut off. Next thing I remember is them excavating his house. Fast forward to now and he's on trial for the murder of a little girl who went missing from our area when I was in primary school. Always gives me the willies when I think about walking past his house on the way home from school. I lived in a very remote area. No cable, dial-up internet until 2010, no public transit, etc. All us kids who grew up out there were a little strange, but there was this one guy who put us all to shame. He always seemed a little slow. He was about seven years older than me, but would come over to play all the time when my younger sister and I were really little. My parents took pity on him, I guess. Also, this being the late 80s, early 90s, things were a little different. We were free-range kids. He used to shit in our yard all the time, and my parents used to joke about it. To be fair, it was the bushes we all pooed outside, but usually not in our neighbor's front yards. The last straw, the reason he wasn't allowed to come over anymore, was one day he punched me in the face, I'm a girl, stole our kitten, rode off down the road on his bike, and abandoned the kitten in a ditch beside the road. My older sister just happened to see him take the cat, followed him, and rescued her from the ditch. My sister told our parents, and the neighbor was banned. One day, when I was about seven, I went for a walk with my dog down to the beach and back. I kept having this weird feeling I was being watched, but ignored it, as I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. When I was almost home, creepy teen neighbor popped out of the bushes beside the road. He told me he had been following me the whole time. He said he was in a special club, and each person picked a girl to essentially stalk. I was his subject. He said he peered in our windows after dark and watched my family going to the bathroom. We had a window in our bathroom in the shower. To this day, I have a hard time going to the bathroom with the shower curtain open anywhere. My parents replaced the window with opaque glass blocks, but I still get the heaves from that window. He said he was going to make me his. I told him to suck it and stomped home with my dog. I don't remember if I told my parents, but I don't think so. I can't remember much about how the attack started. I only have fragmented memories of different sexual assaults happening in various places. The woods, my backyard, near the beach. I do remember one time in this fort he had on his property, but don't remember how I got there. There was one instance involving a badminton racket and my ass. He told me if I told anyone he'd get my little sister, but he ended up doing some stuff to her too. Before it got as bad as what happened to me, we told our parents, but anything like that is too much. Nothing was done. I don't know why the cops weren't called when I showed up with a bleeding butthole. All I can say is it was a huge fail on my parents and the authorities' behalf. I think I remember something about my mom going to talk to his mom, and his mom saying we made the whole thing up, but I don't know if this is true or not. The whole thing got swept under the rug, and weirdly, I forgot it ever happened. I didn't start getting flashbacks until puberty. When my sister and I were in our early 20s, she and my parents had a drunken heart-to-heart -heart about it, and there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. I was so pissed. How could they do nothing, then years later act all shocked about the whole thing? Once, when I was about 23, my mom got sucked into this landmark conference thing through her work. That night, she called me out of the blue. She told me about her creepy uncle and how he tried to molest my mom, but my mom scared him off, so he went after my aunt instead. The family swept it all under the rug and my aunt became a teenage heroin addict. 
By this time my mom was crying, saying, I swore to myself then, if anything like that ever happened to my kids, I'd kill the bastard who did it. At the time I was livid. I mumbled by and hung up and didn't talk to my parents for another six months, drowning my sorrows in my own scorching heroin addiction. Now I like to think it was her roundabout way of apologizing, maybe? I'd hate to think otherwise that my mom could be so blithe and clueless. I finally kicked my habit for good two years and three months ago. Things are pretty good with my family. I had a good upbringing other than that and my parents did the best they could. I'm lucky compared to some people I know. We're all way closer now. I don't know what happened to the creepy neighbor. Last I heard he had moved to an even more remote location. The statute of limitations ran out years ago anyway. I forgive him because I choose not to carry that baggage around anymore. He's the one who has to live with himself. I grew up in a very run-of-the-mill, middle-class neighborhood in San Antonio. Our house sat on a corner, and the fence around the backyard had horizontal wood beams that almost formed an X as opposed to the vertical fence posts I am more familiar with. Because of this, there were larger gaps between the beams, and seeing through was fairly easy. Another detail worth noting, our back gate on the side of the house near the road had been wide open many mornings. Because of this, my dad had looped some wire through the latch, twisted it like a bread tie to keep it engaged and closed, but we would still find it open. In the backyard, there was a large deck and an above-ground pool that the deck was built up to on one end. A huge, beautiful oak tree shaded the deck and the part of the pool closest to the house. My sister and I would anchor our feet at the farthest edge, closest to the back corner of the fence, and sunbathe on our floats. This incident occurred on a Sunday. My grandfather was visiting, and he, along with my parents, was inside napping. My older sister was gone with her friends to a different pool, and I decided to go float in the backyard. My mom closed the blinds to the back and habitually locked the back door before laying down on the couch to snooze. I was in the pool for maybe 20 minutes when I noticed someone standing on the other side of the fence looking in. The sun was shining in my face, so I couldn't see him well, found it weird, but didn't say anything. I saw him walk off and didn't think much about it. Minutes passed, and I decided to swim around a bit to cool off and get back on the float, this time on my stomach, with my face looking up at the house instead of towards the fence. It felt like just a minute passed when I heard the sound of wood creaking. I turned around, and this man was halfway over my back fence, maybe 15 feet away from me once he hit the ground. Part of me was in shock, and I froze for a moment before sheer terror and panic took over. This was not a dream, it was really happening, and I needed to get inside now. The pool felt Olympic-sized, and I couldn't get to the edge and climb out fast enough. By the time I made it out of the pool and started running to the back door, the man had made his way around the pool and was also up on the deck coming towards me. He was maybe in his late twenties or early thirties, pretty thin, and around my height five foot nine for context. He just walked the entire time and never spoke. I reached the door, and it was locked. I started screaming, let me in, let me in, and pounding on the door. At least my mom was right there to unlock it, but 30 seconds felt like 10 minutes. When my mom opened the door, he was standing right behind me with this blank look in his eyes. I was crying, my grandpa was freaking out, and the man was still just standing there looking inside. My dad came downstairs, went crazy screaming at the man, pushed him, and told him to get the F out. My mom was on the phone with the police at this point, and the next moment made the whole thing ten times creepier. The man got up, walked around the house over to our back gate, which had the wire in the latch, untwisted it, and pushed through, leaving the gate wide open. He walked back across the street and into our neighbor's house. The police arrived, and it turned out the man had been staying with his sister for the past eight weeks, and was on parole, recently released from jail theft and assault charges. He had also broken into a different neighbor's home and stolen some china and a few of their family photos. He went back to jail, and we never found our back gate left open again. I still get chills thinking about this because my sister and I both had our bedrooms downstairs with our windows facing the backyard, 
and I just know he was coming in there and watching us at night. My parents moved out of this home a few years later when I went to college, but I slept upstairs on a pull-out couch for months after this, and will never live on a ground floor again if I can help it. I know how it sounds, but there's just no gentler way to put it. Something is eating my neighbors. I first noticed it last Tuesday morning, when I looked out the window and saw that Lewis, the old man in the apartment across the street, wasn't out on his balcony by 7 a.m., waving to that bald figure with his fluffy bathrobe, coffee cup, and newspaper had become part of my morning routine, and his absence bothered me more than I would have imagined. It was as though without me noticing, some subtle and sinister change had taken place in my world, throwing it into a disquieting new orbit. The apartment two stories above Lewis had also gone dark. Two kids lived there, and they were always up to something, sticking their drawings to the window, jumping on the beds, or singing into a child-sized plastic karaoke machine. Now, however, there was nothing but blackness in their rooms, and an ominous breeze seemed to blow through their white curtains. Even when it rained on Wednesday and Thursday, no one bothered to close the windows. Worse still, when I rang Lewis to check on him with no answer, of course I saw that his mailbox was stuffed full of mail and newspapers. Lewis was so meticulous I could have set my watch by him. There was no way he would have left without putting a hold on his precious daily news. Even so, I didn't really start to worry until the noise upstairs came to a sudden stop. The twenty-something couple in that unit had a very active lifestyle, getting up early, working out in the middle of the day, and hosting parties late into the night. From the sound of it, they also had a very healthy relationship. Lately, however, there's been nothing but silence. If I hadn't started working remotely, I doubt I would have paid attention to any of this. But now that I'm trapped in my apartment with nothing but time, these little differences become all the more clear. They make me remember things, things that at the moment didn't seem important, and also things that I prefer to forget. There are a lot of apartment buildings on this street. Some old, some new, without even alleys to divide them. Looking out the window, it's clear how easy it would be to move from one building to another. There are rooftops, sewers, and even empty gaps beneath the buildings. When I had the bathroom redone, the back wall had to be removed. A middle-aged plumber on his smoke break pointed through the gaping hole in the tile wall. The circle of pink insulation around it made the black pit in my wall look like a toothless mouth. Inside was a three-foot gap filled with a tangle of pipes and dusty spider webs. I once pulled a rat as big as my arm out of a space like that. The plumber exhaled a cloud of smoke. Another time, we found a bedroll, a bottle full of piss, and dirty tissues on the other side of someone's wall. That's the thing about these gaps between buildings. Anyone, or anything, can live there, and there's no way to know until it's too late. At the time, I thought the about-to-retire plumber him was just having a laugh at the expense of the remote working yuppie me who couldn't stick two pipes together to save his life. But as more and more apartments around me fell into a dark, dead silence, I wasn't so sure. They couldn't all be on vacation. I used to enjoy taking showers at night, but lately I found myself pressing my ear to the wet tile wall, listening for sounds behind the wall or inside the pipes. And when I dream, my dreams are of falling through that tight, lightless space between the walls. Millions of people live in this city, all strangers to one another. And if one person, or even an entire family went missing, how long would it take anyone to notice? If several went missing all at once, how long would it take the underfunded, overworked authorities to recognize a pattern? Weeks? Months? Even longer? Three nights ago, I woke to a sudden crash from below. My eyes snapped open. I lay in the darkness, heart thundering and paralyzed with fright, as something heavy was dragged across the floor of the apartment beneath mine. I finally mustered the courage to get out of bed and investigate, but by then it was too late. Standing in front of my neighbor's bare wooden door, I realized how alone and unarmed I truly was. Annie? I whispered my downstairs neighbor's name, but there was no response. A few hours later, after the sun came up this time, I tried again. I was about to give up when I remembered that I'd watered Annie's plants for a month while she was on vacation. She told me to keep the spare key. It was probably still in my kitchen drawer. I knocked, 
rang, and made every other sound I could think of before entering her apartment. I knew full well that what I was doing was probably illegal, and definitely an invasion of privacy. Annie's apartment smelled faintly of marijuana and mint oil, just as I remembered, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was another odor hiding under those familiar scents something foul and reptilian. The blinds were drawn, and flies buzzed around a half-eaten bowl of soup on the kitchen table. A knocked-over chair lay on the floor beside it. Annie? I tried again. My neighbor's jackets and shoes were all in their places. Water dripped from the washcloth in her shower. It was like she had never left the apartment, and yet. My eyes were drawn to the large ventilation shaft in the bathroom wall. To my anxious mind, it looked like an empty eye socket perhaps with something nameless staring out at me from the other side. The wall below it was discolored somehow. I tiptoed closer through the gloomy apartment and reached out to touch it. The wall was slick with a slimy substance that emitted that same strange odor. The floor creaked behind me. Ooh, what the hell do you think you're doing? A woman who looked like a younger version of Annie stood in the doorway, her mouth open in shock. Ami's sister, Ellen. She was already dialing the cops. I looked down at the flashlight in my left hand and the hammer in my right. I can explain, I pleaded. I was just looking for Ami. I heard a weird noise last night, and then when she didn't answer the door, I thought. My voice trailed off. Ellen glared at me skeptically with her thumb frozen above the call button. With one hand on her hip, she slowly lowered her phone. You touch anything? Ellen asked. What? No, I just... Good. I was supposed to meet Ami for lunch, but she never showed, and my sister would die before she'd miss an appointment. I hoped not, but given the circumstances, I kept my mouth shut. Ellen opened the blinds and rummaged through her sister's things while I did my best to describe what I heard. I don't get it. Ellen frowned. Her wallet, phone, keys, they're all here. Unless Ami walked out of here in her PJ. S. She should be around here somewhere. But there was no sign of Ami, not under the bed, not on the balcony. She was just gone. After an awkward mid-hallway handshake, Ellen and I parted ways. I still wasn't sure if she planned to go to the police, and if so, I didn't dare to share my theory with her. But that weird mucus was still thick on my fingers. After a fitful nap, I decided to ask the older couple across from me if they'd seen or heard anything strange. As I crossed the corridor, however, a horrible thought struck me. What if they didn't answer? What if I was the last one left, alone in the building with whatever had taken on me? The two minutes between my knock and Marie Puig opening her door felt eternal. I dragged myself out of my paranoid thoughts and tried to smile. I told Mrs. Barr Puig that I'd heard some disturbing things lately and asked if we could speak somewhere private. She motioned me inside and put a kettle on. Her husband had gone out, but would be back shortly. In Mrs. Poor Puig's apartment, not a hair was out of place. A loud game show boomed from the television, and the air smelled of lemon cleaner and fresh cookies. My own half-baked theory was starting to feel very crazy indeed. I stammered through a short version of Ami's disappearance and asked if Marie Puig had noticed anything unusual lately. Not since I let my hearing aid go, Mrs. Puig laughed. You'll have to forgive me, but I can barely hear anything at all. I've got an appointment to get a new one next week. Things just aren't made like they used to be. When was the last time you saw Ami? Yesterday night. She was arguing with some man on the phone. Mrs. Puig leaned in close. In situations like this, it's always the boyfriend. Trust me. Disappointed, I returned to my apartment and tried to lose myself in the mountain of unanswered emails and incomplete tasks that awaited me. The sun had set by the time I finally logged off, exhausted. I was on my way to the shower when I looked up and realized, for the first time, that all the units in my building had the same oversized ventilation shaft. I reached out my hand to touch the wall below it, and when I took my fingers away, they were coated in a familiar smelling slime. I went to the gym to shower. I couldn't stomach being naked and alone with whatever might be on the other side of my wall. On my way home, I found Mrs. Puig, well-dressed as always, being helped into a waiting taxi cab. She waved me over. I meant to tell you, she practically shouted into my ear. 
My husband never came back from his walk this morning. The police are combing the park for him and everything. I'm going to stay with my son until things get settled down. Just thought you ought to know. With that, she was gone. A clammy, lonely sensation crept up my spine as I returned to my apartment. I couldn't shake the feeling that maybe I ought to do the same thing. Rent a hotel room someplace, wait for all this to just blow over. But I'd have to come back eventually. And what if whatever was between the walls was still hungry when I did? Even though it was after 10 p.m., I grabbed my trusty hammer and used plywood to board up every vent, every window, every other access point to my apartment that I could think of. I didn't have to worry about noise complaints. I probably didn't have any neighbors left to disturb. Uncounted hours later, I woke up in the pitch blackness of my sealed up apartment. My home was as dark as the dream I'd been having. Another nightmare of dusty insulation and tangled pipes. A pounding sound was coming from somewhere inside my apartment. Three methodical taps, one after the other, it was no random noise. Something was trying to get in. I grabbed my flashlight, but its batteries must have died after my excursion into Ami's unit. Lost in my own apartment and unable to find a light switch, I bounced off of furniture that seemed to have moved during the night, until I finally glimpsed a glow up ahead. The hallway. That's where the pounding was coming from. Daylight blinded me as I flung open my front door. A slender Asian man in a black suit and tie stood before me. Lucas Williams, he asked. I nodded, shielding my eyes from the painful brightness. I'm Agent Y. I'm investigating some dangerous, unusual occurrences in your neighborhood, and I believe that you might be able to help me. Can I step inside? I let out a deep sigh of relief. The Calvary was here. The authorities had finally figured out what was going on, and they were going to take care of it. In retrospect, I probably should have looked more closely at Agent Y's badge. I should have asked him for a warrant or spoken to him outside. But at the time, I was so thrilled to find out that I wasn't crazy that I welcomed the young man with open arms. I flicked on the lights, embarrassed by the boarded up, chaotic mess of my apartment. Agent Y, however, seemed to take it in stride. As I'm sure you've noticed, Lucas, there have been a number of disappearances in this area. I nodded vigorously. As part of our investigation, we're asking the residents of buildings on these streets to permit us to temporarily install motion-activated cameras in their apartment. These cameras will alert us to the presence of any intruder in your unit and allow us to respond immediately. I frowned. This was unexpected. I wanted to help, but still. Cameras? Watching me all the time? Please, Lucas, help us to help you. Of course, in the end, I agreed. With his slick black suit and sidearm, Agent Y seemed trustworthy, and besides what choice did I have if I wanted my life to go back to normal? After Agent Y installed his camera and left, however, I found something. Something I would have mentioned to him if I had noticed it sooner. The plywood I had used to cover the ventilation shaft lay on the floor. It had fallen, or been pushed, out of place. Although I should have known better, I replaced the batteries in my flashlight, mounted a stool, and stuck my head into the ventilation shaft. The dark, narrow space was about the size of my head, and it was difficult to look around. At first, I saw nothing but dust. But then I caught sight of the man-sized trail of slime that slithered off into the darkness. Shuddering, I replaced the plywood and doubled the amount of nails that I hammered into it. For three days, I heard nothing from Agent Y. As far as I could tell, there were no new disappearances either. But on the third morning, I woke once again to urgent pounding on my door. I was in such a hurry to answer it that I didn't notice that the plywood covering the vent had once again fallen to the floor. Lucas Williams, Agent Y asked again, as if to confirm that I was really me. We've discovered something you need to see. May we come in? This time, Agent Y wasn't alone. Two more men in black suits were behind him. A dark, spindly man he called Agent Gelida, and a stocky, nervous woman who went by Agent Lopez. Agent Y seemed much more on edge than he had during his last visit. The others swept my apartment as we spoke. I started to protest, but then I remembered that the agents had already seen every corner of it anyway, via their cameras. I'm going to ask you to take a survey for me, Lucas. Agent Y sat me down at my work desk with a paper and pen. 
It's very important that you answer all of the questions honestly. Can you do that for me, Lucas? I had no idea what was going on, but I nodded. After all, what was the harm in answering a few questions? While I was busy filling in bubbles and ticking boxes, agents Gelida and Lopez scanned my walls with strange instruments, collected samples, and set up a laptop on my kitchen table. Although I strained my ears to their limit, I wasn't able to eavesdrop on the hushed conversation between them. Besides, I was struggling with some of the questions. As I answered them, an unsettling pattern seemed to emerge, but I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was. How long have you lived in this unit? When was the last time you ate? What is your earliest memory? Where is the last place you slept? Are you sure you want to do it here? Agent Lopez was hissing to Agent Y. It was all I heard of their conversation before Agent Y motioned for me to sit in front of the laptop that was open in front of the kitchen table. He nodded through the answers to my survey questions, as though they confirmed something he'd long suspected. As he prepared a video to play on the screen, I was uncomfortably aware of the aggressive presence of Agents Gelida and Lopez behind me. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see that their hands rested on their weapons. I'm going to show you a video now, Lucas, Agent Y explained, and I warn you, what you're about to see may disturb you. Please, try to remain calm. I didn't understand what I had to be disturbed about. After all, the image on the screen was me. It was a night vision recording of my bedroom, captured by the cameras agent Y had installed. He fast forwarded through several hours of me sleeping, tossing and turning in bed, and then, in the recording, I watched my left leg suddenly stuck out rigidly beneath the sheets. It seemed to extend somehow, followed by my right. My hands pawed at my bedroom wall as my arms and fingers stretched, almost doubling in length. I brought my hand to my mouth as I watched the me on the screen distend into something hideous and wrong, and slither across the floor toward the bathroom ventilation shaft. I was still processing the nightmarish video when Agent Y brought up another clip. This was grainier footage from a security camera. It showed Marie Puig's husband, Javier, walking through a dark alley on the far side of our building. As he passed a sewer grate, a horrifically distended hand that I now recognized as my own shot up with tremendous force and grabbed his leg, dragging him down. I'd seen enough. I retched all over the floor, but turned away from the puddle immediately afraid of what or who I might see in it. We're aware that you're a special case, Agent Y was saying, from what felt like very far away, and we know that it's not your fault. For beings like you, this is part of a natural cycle that occurs every 30 years or so. We're going to get you the help you need, but there are crimes here that have to be answered for. Louis Dubois, Rachel Kellerson and her two children, Tom and Royce, Javier Puig, Ami Martin and several off. Wait. I held up a hand weakly. Ami Martin. That can't be. I was in my apartment when she disappeared. I heard her. I fell silent as a groaning noise echoed through the pipes above us. F. Agent Lopez drew her pistol. What? Agent Gelider responded. That means there are two of them. From the darkness of the ventilation shaft in my bathroom, a pair of glowing eyes stared out at me and grinned. Just moved into a new neighborhood and I'm starting to get really worried. My neighbor, who I do not know at all, comes outside every night when it gets dark and stares at my house with a creepy look. He doesn't move during this staring session, and it typically lasts about 20 minutes to an hour. I have called the police about this situation, but they are not much help, and I don't know how to handle this on my own. One time I tried staring back at him, and he just wouldn't budge. I went and knocked on his door one time, and the house was eerie silent, and there was no answer. When I returned to my porch, I turned around, and he was just standing there in the window looking at me with that creepy stare. I have been here a few months, and he doesn't miss a single night of doing this, and one night I was taking out the trash, and he was just standing at the end of the my driveway staring at me, and I said, hello, what are you doing? And he just stood there and wouldn't budge, didn't say a word. I walked away because I felt like something was about to happen. Literally, as I'm writing this post, he is staring at my house. I live alone and I'm 45 years old. What do I do? Update October 25th.
I would like to update everyone and give some more info since I'm getting a lot of questions and I want to thank everyone for the advice. I'm losing a lot of sleep over this and last night I was actually able to get some sleep so it was a relief to finally get some answers on what to do next. Hopefully I can clear up a few things. 1. I don't have any pets. 2. I don't have any flood lights or security, but that is about to change. I'm heading out to buy some stuff today. 3. No, I do not own a firearm and don't have the money for one at the moment, sadly. 4. I asked a few people about this guy and nobody knows anything so I will reach out and try to get more info. He does have a car in the front yard, but it doesn't look like it's moved in years. I have never seen the guy leave his house unless it was to come outside and stare at mine. 5. He looks to be in his early 40s. I have only seen him in the daytime one time, and that was when he was staring at me out his window. He only seems to come out at night. I work during the day during the week, so I'm unsure if he is outside during this time. 6. The police say they can't get involved unless he steps on the property, which he has not done so far. 7. I will be getting an alarm system installed next paycheck. Will have to be an extra bill but will be worth it because I'm genuinely scared. If you guys only knew the way this guy looks at my house, it has honestly freaked me out and I do not have the option to move. And this is a nice neighborhood and I didn't expect to be scared to death. This is like some stuff out of a movie and I'm unsure on what to do and don't know where to go for help. I'm scared to approach him because of the stuff that's happened so far. Thanks for your time and reading this and hopefully I can find a solution soon. There's this guy that I always see hanging out in a blue truck in my apartment complex parking lot. He always tries to talk to me which being a woman, unfortunately, is pretty common. Yesterday he called me over to his truck and asked if I wore glasses. Last night at 1am I get a knock on my door, but when I look out the peephole no one is there. This morning I found a note on my door that says, Call me. It's Jesse in the blue truck and his phone number. I have never seen this guy inside the complex, so I don't know how he knew which unit I was in. I'm scared. What should I do? Update. I made a report with the local police and told the property manager who saw Jesse and apparently without even asking or prompting Jesse told him that he left a note at my door. Property manager said he was strange and erratic. They have security watching my unit apparently and Jesse doesn't live here. my current neighbor upstairs in my block of flats. When I first moved in he helped out and I thought he was a friendly guy. Then after a week or so he knocked on my door and when I answered he walked in. Okay nothing creepy about that but still rude. He asks do I want to see his flat and I was like sure whatever. So I go upstairs and he has his laptop open with all this porn and whatnot and he trying to get me to drink vodka neat which I refused. He kept asking where my husband and kids were and I was like, Erm, I don't have either. We watched some music videos and he then he gave me some crayons and asked me to draw for him. I did. I was texting a mate to ask him to call me urgently, but he kept asking why and he didn't. Anyway, I made my excuses to leave and he got in a right strop, telling me to F off. So I did. A few days later, my parents came to visit and he knocked on the door. I opened it and he tried to let himself in, but I blocked him and said I was busy as my parents were here. He then told me to prove it. I shut the door on him. Now he knocks on my door to leave packs of bin bags outside and runs away when I answer. Another time, me and the guy downstairs were asking the neighbors for help with Wi-Fi and upstairs guy asked if we were together, and when we said no, he stroked my arm. I went back downstairs. A few months later, and I have only seen him once, and there wasn't any creepiness. One. 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 Probably my current neighbor. She called CPS on us last year because my older two sons, seven and five at the time, were playing football in the front yard during a sun shower. She basically told CPS that we locked all of our kids, including our toddler, outside during a thunderstorm and wouldn't let them back inside. It was a complete lie and the case was closed. A few days later my wife was outside playing with our toddler. The neighbor approached my wife and asked her if she learned her lesson. 
We try not to make any contact with her anymore, but she has made complaints about our treehouse and complaints about the kids playing too loudly outside. She also called CPS on our friends across the street because their son had a black eye. He got the black eye in wrestling, but the neighbor called anyway. She frequently yells at kids for not wearing jackets at the bus stop and still goes to the bus stop with her 12-year-old. I let my kids ride their bikes to school with their friends, and she has expressed concern about that as well. She's got issues, but she is moving this summer. We'll be in the clear soon enough. The neighbor I live next to right now is a middle-aged woman with two small kids. Her name is Karen, but I've taken to calling her Crazy Karen for obvious reasons. Our interactions have been nothing short of bizarre. It all started innocently enough when I decided to spruce up the front of my house. I have a small stoop, and I thought a few pansies and colorful pots would be a lovely addition. Little did I know that this simple act of gardening would set off a chain of events that would forever label her as Crazy Karen in my mind. One sunny afternoon, as I was tending to my pansies, I heard a commotion next door. Karen was frantically waving her arm, shouting, and pointing at my seemingly innocent pansy pots. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw her on the phone, talking to the police. She claimed I was growing opium poppies on my front stoop, of all things. Police arrived, surveyed my pansies, and promptly left, clearly perplexed by the absurdity of the situation. I had a good laugh at her expense that day, but it was only the beginning. A few weeks later, as I was about to pay the pizza delivery guy, he encountered a problem with his debit machine. He was fumbling with it for a minute or so when out of nowhere, Karen sprinted across her lawn, wild-eyed and frantic, screaming at the top of her lung. Sir, are you all right? Is this woman holding you hostage? Do you need help, sir? I was baffled, to say the least, and the pizza delivery guy was equally confused. I assured her that everything was fine, but she seemed genuinely convinced that I was in grave danger. It took a lot of effort to convince her that I wasn't in any trouble, and the poor pizza delivery guy was probably traumatized by the entire incident. After these two incidents, I couldn't help but despise Karen. It seemed like she was constantly on the lookout for something to be outraged about or to play the hero in a situation that didn't require her involvement. I started to avoid any interactions with her, whether it was on the front lawn or in the mailbox. It was as if I had been cast in my very own reality TV show, with Crazy Karen as the unpredictable co-star. In the end, I couldn't understand why she was so quick to jump to wild conclusions and make frantic calls to the authorities. I just wanted to live in peace and tend to my pansies in tranquility. As I looked at my flourishing flowers, I couldn't help but shake my head and think, well, at least my pansies aren't opium poppies. There was this old guy who lived with his wife and his dog a few doors away in a big house. He rarely left his home, and when he did, he only took his dog for a walk. He also talked very rarely and seemed to avoid other people, while his wife was somewhat more social. The couple lived on our street for a few years, and everything appeared to be fine. However, someday they divorced, and the lady moved away for reasons unknown. The old guy remained with the dog in his house, and a few years passed. There was never something suspicious, and, aside from his usual strange behavior, everything seemed pretty normal. One morning... That was approximately nine, seven years ago. I left as usual my house to catch the school bus. Our street is relatively quiet, and normally there isn't much stuff going on. But this morning was a bit different. There were a few neighbors on the street, and my parents said that there's something wrong with the old guy, which lived on the end of the street, but nothing specific was known. So I went to school and didn't thought much about it. As I returned and exited the bus at the bus stop, I saw that the whole street was cordoned off and evacuated. Police cars and officers were everywhere, and even a SWAT team was there. I had no idea what was going on. I met up with my parents and they explained to me that the old guy tried to commit self-kill and planned to take the whole street with him. He flooded his entire basement with gasoline and had an improvised bomb in his garden shed, which was essentially a big pile of propane gas tanks tied together. 
A timer clock and a toaster served as the fuse mechanism for both the bomb and the basement. The whole thing was rigged to explode between 7 8 a.m. in the morning. A smaller version of this explosive was placed in the trash bin of the guys who lived right next to this maniac. Obviously, it was something personal. Before the old man triggered the bomb, he wrecked the entire interior of his house with an axe and then went to the garage with his poor dog, locked the gate, and turned his car engine on. He put his dog in the trunk and seated himself in the driver's seat, waiting to die from asphyxiation before he would be blown to pieces. Luckily, the plan didn't work out because a neighbor heard the car engine and became suspicious. He looked through the garage window and at first thought the man had a heart attack. So he broke the window and entered, only to see the man more or less conscious in his car. At first, he had no idea what was going on, but then he noticed the distinctive smell of gasoline. He broke the door to enter the house and discovered the mess the old guy created. The neighbor immediately called the cops and a bomb squad took care of the explosives just in time. Unfortunately, the dog suffocated in the trunk and was already dead when the neighbor arrived. The authorities arrested that guy and put him into a psychiatric ward after the court process. He will remain there until the end of his life. The estimated blast radius of the bomb would have been sufficient enough to destroy several houses and do severe damage to the surrounding area. I had a really creepy neighbor probably early 40s male. I was seventh grade when I first met him. He was a very nice guy, but he just had something off about him. My mother is very patriotic. Our whole house was red, white, and blue inside. One day, walking home from school, he is sitting in his front lawn and tells me he's having a red, white, and blue sale in his backyard, and I should check it out. I told him, sure, but I need to go get money first, and walked off. My neighbor directly to the side of me was a big guy, mid-30s, covered in prison tattoos, but had turned his life around, although very intimidating if you don't know him. Since my parents weren't home, I went to his house and told him. He walked over to that guy's house with me and he took him to the backyard. Sure enough, it had red, white, and blue items for sale. I still thought something was off. Two years later, he was arrested for attempting to get a child in his house. Edit for clarification. I knew not to go into this man's backyard, which is why I went to my neighbor instead, knowing he would protect me. I also wanted someone to know about it in case he tried to come to my house. Also, guy not guy. I just talked to prison tattoo guy on Facebook. Apparently after we were done over there, he called the cops to let them know clearly something strange was going on. He also told my parents, which makes sense now since they told me to walk home on the other side of the street. Hey all, I'm Jean Baptiste. Everyone calls me Jeeb. About two weeks ago, my parents moved me and my Lyle bro into a fancier home in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Dad got a new, better, paying job. That's the reason they gave us. I know they wanted to keep Sam out of trouble. He's a good kid. He's just got a lot of imagination. I tell him he should make comics. Anyway, we were only there for a day or two when Sam starts to notice our new next door neighbor. I'm like, what's the big deal? Because he's telling me I have to come see the neighbor quick, quick before she goes in. So I rush over to his bedroom window because it looks down on the neighbor's house. I'm thinking I'm going to see a weirdo with a stuffed cat or something. But it's just this older woman, maybe about 40. She looks pretty in like a Barbie doll kind of way. It's weird though because it's really raining out and she just walking to the road to check her mailbox. You see the titties on that? Sam asks. I slap the back of his head. Dad taught us to treat women with respect. He knows better. He's right, though. Damn, she's stacked. And with her shirt getting all wet, we're seeing a lot more than we should. Bet you wish you picked this room, Sam said. I have to admit I was a little jealous. The neighbor on my side's a fat guy who likes mowing shirtless. How's that fair? So I said to him, I think we'll be spending a lot of quality time together. And that's how and why we started paying so much attention to the neighbor. Sam swiped Dad's old army surplus binoculars. I had a telescope from when I was 12 and thought I'd be able to see other planets and stuff. We started turning out the lights at night and hoped for a show. 
Day 6. It didn't take long before we noticed some odd things about her. Like, she never sleeps. Her lights stay on all night. We see her walking around, still in the same shirt, like she didn't change it in days. I don't care if she don't sleep, Sam said. Why the hell won't she get naked? Maybe she's a meth head, I said. That's a big thing in Oklahoma. She didn't look like a meth head. How'd you know? The internet. We moved in six days ago. That night was the first Saturday after we moved in. That's when we saw the first really strange thing happen. We're peeking out the window like usual. Nothing's happened in a while, and we're getting tired. Screw this, I say. She's never going to show the goods. Jabe, Sam said. No, I'm going to bed. I can see tits on the internet all I want. Sam grabbed my hand. Not my arm, my hand. He hadn't done that since he was like five. Jabe, look, he said with a swallow. He was pointing to her backyard. I looked where he was pointing. He wasn't sure what I was looking at at first. It's 2 a.m. There isn't really any light in the backyard except moonlight. And she has a big tree back there. So I used the telescope. I'm a bit slow with it. Once I get it pointed and adjusted, I see. The white shape comes into focus, and I'm looking at a face, her face. She's in her backyard, peeking out from behind that tree, and she's looking right up at our window. Our lights are off, so she shouldn't be able to see us. Right, but she does. You know how you just know. We knew. I jump back from the window with a gasp. Oh crap, I say. How long she been there? He just shakes his head. We should be more embarrassed than scared. I'm a little of both, but Sam's just scared. That's weird, man, he says. That's weird. I tell him not to worry. She's probably just turning the tables on us. We were kind of invading her privacy, after all, so that'll teach us. Then he asks, you think she's still there? I don't want to look. It's just too freaky. So I take out my phone, turn on the camera, and take a video for about 30 seconds. I just hold it up to the window and wiggle it around a little. Then I pull the phone back in. When we play back the video, we're relieved. Just the tree. No white face watching us from behind it. My wiggling somehow got the whole backyard. She ain't there. Sam sighed and threw himself back on his bed. I decided to watch the video over again, just to be sure. The backyard really was clear. It's just that wasn't all. When I was pulling the camera back, it briefly pointed down, directly below our window. And there she was, staring right up. Right there. Close enough, she could probably hear us talking. I shouted a curse word and dropped my phone. Sam sat right up. I showed him, just to be sure I wasn't imagining things. He saw it too. We slept in my room that night and decided to tell Dad what happened in the morning. We knew it wouldn't go well. But at this point, Dad was less scary than the busty neighbor. Sunday. Dad was pissed all right. He made us march over to her front door and apologize for peeping. Probably the most awkward thing we ever had to do. Get this. She answers the door in this loose, lacy, lingery deal that showed us everything. I looked behind me to see if anyone else was witnessing this. But nope. When I got control of my jaw again, I say I'm sorry we watched her. We were both hanging our heads in shame. When I looked up to see if she was mad or if she was trying to seduce us or something, it was weird. Like, have you ever seen someone with no expression at all? It's like she was hypnotized. You should come in, she said. She didn't seem to feel it. She just said it. Sam looked to me. I think he was ready to take her up on the offer. I can't say I blame him. She looked real good. But I told her we had to be getting back. Dad's waiting. She closed the door without a word. And Dad asked when we got back. I told him she didn't seem mad. And I told him what she was wearing. I felt if we were going to be in trouble, he should know she's teasing us too. I can tell he doesn't believe me. He says he's going over there to apologize for us. If I find your lying, you'll be wearing your balls for earrings. Hear me. We stood in the kitchen waiting for him. When he got back, his face looked slack and pale. He didn't seem mad at us anymore. He just looked like he'd seen something awful. Sam elbowed me. 
as if I didn't notice myself. Sit down, he told us. So we did and we all started eating breakfast. Mom was still asleep, by the way. She always stays up late, catching up the DVR on Saturday nights. Don't bother with that woman ever again, he said between bites. Okay, we agreed. We didn't dare question him when he was like this. I mean, I've never seen him like this before, and that's what was so scary about it. We kept eating our breakfast in silence, until he asked, I ever tell you about Red Finney? He mentioned the name before. We knew Red was a kid in his neighborhood when Dad was growing up, somewhere in Baltimore, but we didn't know anything really about him. We asked before, but he always changes the subject. So we shook our heads. Red was stupid. You hear me? Stupid kid. Always poking his nose where it had no business. He took a bite of his scrambled eggs. There was this big dark house on our street, three stories. No other house in the neighborhood like that. It was there before the neighborhood got built around it. Real old family just held on to that land. We had all stories about this house. We'd all look when the lights came on at night. Never see anyone come or go all day. One time we're watching and we hear this scream. We know it's from that house. And it didn't sound good. From that day, Red got the notion in his head he was going to get in there and see what was going on in that house. What does that make Red? Dad asked. Stupid, we both said. Anyway, then one day Red was gone. You thought this was going to be a heist? We go in there and find some ancient jewels and a ghost and solve a murder. If Red did what he said he was going to do, he didn't tell us. And we didn't want anything to do with it. Breaking and entering was not a part of how. We wanted to start life. He just went missing. Never found him. We thought all kinds. Maybe he ran away. Maybe he killed himself somewhere. Dad, I said. You mentioned house for a reason? Oh yeah, that was another one. We thought maybe he went in there and maybe just never got out. But here's the thing. He paused to take a long drink of coffee, like he was steadying himself or something. When Red went missing, that came up, and we met the owner of the house. Dad finished off his breakfast after that, took his plate to the kitchen sink to clean it off, stuck it in the dishwasher. Me and Sam looked at each other. Well, what I'm saying is, he said, that woman next door was on the same street as me when I was a boy. Damn, Sam said. She aged better than you. You're not listening. Too busy wise. Cracking. What I'm saying is that woman next door was on the same street as me, right? When I was a boy, she was a grown woman, looked exactly the same. You don't forget a woman looks like that. What? Sam asked. Dad, that's not possible, I said. It's not for me to say what's possible or not. I don't need to know why or how. I'm just telling you like it is. And you're not to bother with that woman. Now let's get to church. I don't think Sam and I had ever been so quiet and well-behaved in church. I don't know what was going on in his head. Probably something like what was going on in mine. Who is that woman? Is she related to the woman Dad grew up near? That's one hell of a coincidence. Not impossible. I mean, you hear of long-lost siblings working together in the same Taco Bell without knowing it. So who knows? It's just... When you add her strained behavior to it, it's just a big UT. Since then, we've only casually looked out the window. She hasn't been in the backyard staring at us anymore. And we've kept our word to Dad and left her alone. This other part of me just can't get her out of my head. I don't think Sam can either. He slept in my room twice since then. I think she's watching, he said. I asked if he looked. And he says not a chance. That's where it's at. I'll let you know if anything else weird happens. Hopefully not, because we're stuck in this house for a long time. When I was seven, my innocent and seemingly quiet world was turned upside down by an incident that still leaves me incredulous to this day. It all started with an ordinary day a bright and sunny afternoon where the only thing bothering me was an insatiable curiosity about the world. Little did I know that the source of my curiosity would soon become the epicenter of chaos in our tranquil suburban neighborhood. We had a pet, and it wasn't the kind you'd expect to be a source of controversy. It was a rabbit, a fluffy and docile creature, 
that had become a cherished member of our family. We kept it in a hutch in our backyard, and I would spend hours sitting with it, feeding it carrots, and listening to its soft, comforting nibbles. One afternoon, as I was playing in the backyard, a sharp, furious pounding on our front door echoed through the house. I rushed inside to find my mom, her face etched with disbelief and alarm, answering the door. A wave of dread washed over me as I followed her to the entrance, where an angry neighbor stood red-faced and trembling with rage. It was Mr. Johnson, our next-door neighbor. His eyes were wild, his voice a thunderous roar, and he seemed on the brink of losing control. He was there to confront my dad, or so it appeared. Your pet is driving me insane, he yelled, his words dripping with venom. I can't take it anymore. I'll kill that damn animal if it doesn't shut up. My heart raced as I realized that he was talking about our rabbit, our beloved harmless rabbit. My dad, who had been working in his home office, emerged confused and concerned about the commotion. He tried to reason with Mr. Johnson, explaining that our rabbit couldn't possibly be making enough noise to provoke such a violent outburst. But Mr. Johnson wasn't having it. He was convinced that our fluffy friend was responsible for his misery. He continued his tirade, threatening to take matters into his own hands if we didn't do something about it. It was a surreal and terrifying moment for a seven-year-old to witness, as a grown man was willing to resort to violence over the noise of a rabbit. Eventually, after what felt like an eternity, my dad managed to convince Mr. Johnson to give us some time to address the issue. We promised to double-check the Hutch's security and ensure that our rabbit wouldn't escape and roam the yard, which was, in Mr. Johnson's eyes, the root of the problem. As Mr. Johnson stormed off, still seething with anger, I couldn't fathom the irrationality of it all. How could a peaceful, harmless rabbit elicit such a violent reaction from a grown man. So I, 25 female, have a husky that I walk around my quiet neighborhood and brush outside for obvious reasons. Yesterday, around 3 p.m., I'm standing in my front driveway brushing my dog when I turn around to see a complete stranger, grown man, standing behind me. He begins by asking me if he can say hi to my dog because he's seen me around a lot. And already I'm hesitant, but I allow it and at this time I notice he's on FaceTime with his phone pointing at me. Then he tells me he just moved here from South Africa and bought the house at the end of the road. That's been abandoned for over a year now and was never posted for sale. He starts asking me if I'm 16 because he likes 16 year olds following up with, are you alone right now? Is this your house? Is this your car? Do you live alone? Are you around often? Etc. I politely say I'm not willing to answer questions like that and tell him he should leave. He walks into the woods across the street, coming back 15 minutes later, attempting to invite himself into my house and asking more questions, this time along the lines of, do you lock your doors? And are you alone at nighttime? getting upset with me for saying I do not want him on my property and I would be calling our cop neighbor to come outside if he did not leave me alone. He stood in the street watching me walk into the house and lock up before walking away back to the abandoned house. Now I'm just left thinking if I am overreacting or if being totally creeped out is the correct response. Update, I've put in a report and spoken to a couple neighbors, but none of them have seen him around, which I guess is good. And thank you to everyone for the concerns and advice. Growing up, our quiet suburban neighborhood had its share of idiosyncrasies. One of the most peculiar aspects was our next door neighbor's adult son who lived at home. He was a mystery to us, a man of few words, and his presence was a source of both fascination and unease. For as long as I could remember, he would often be seen in their backyard, standing at the edge of the property, watching us intently whenever we played outside. He never spoke to us, never waved back, just stared with an unrelenting, unwavering gaze. We would giggle and wave trying to engage with him, but it was as if we were invisible. This unnerving ritual continued for years, 
and we grew accustomed to his silent, eerie surveillance. It was unsettling, but we had been told that he was mentally disabled, and so we chalked it up to a lack of social awareness. Our parents assured us that he meant no harm, and we did our best to accept his presence as part of the neighborhood's quirks. But one fateful day, our perception of this peculiar neighbor would be shattered. We returned home from school to a scene of chaos. Police cars lined the street, and officers were swarming our neighbor's house. Panic and confusion gripped our parents' faces as they tried to shield us from the unfolding drama. It didn't take long for the truth to emerge. Our silent neighbor had attempted to abduct two other children in the neighborhood. The news sent shockwaves through our quiet community. The reality of the situation was difficult to process. The man we had silently tolerated even sympathized with due to his supposed mental disability had committed a heinous act. The revelation left us in a state of disbelief. We couldn't fathom how someone who had observed us for so long, often from his backyard, could harbor such dark intentions. The neighborhood transformed overnight from a place where kids played freely in the open to one gripped by fear and caution. Our parents, along with the entire community, became vigilant. We were no longer allowed to play outside unattended, our once carefree activities replaced by a constant sense of watchfulness. The innocence of our childhood had been irrevocably altered, replaced by the unsettling realization that danger could lurk even within our seemingly safe neighborhood. The incident served as a stark reminder that appearances could be deceiving and the most unexpected individuals could harbor sinister motives. Our once friendly neighbor, who had merely stared at us from afar, became a haunting presence in our memories, a testament to the fragility of trust and the unpredictability of the world we lived in. My wife and I's downstairs neighbor, Rob, one time Rob mentioned to my wife how he can hear us all the time with a creepy-ass grin on his face. Another time she was painting on our porch and dropped a paintbrush, so she picked it up and saw through the slits of the porch his eyes staring up at her. We have no idea how long he was there for. To add to it, he's married as well. When I was a kid... We had a neighbor next door who hated when I skateboarded by his house. On the sidewalk, because he was a douche. He would scream at my mom telling her how I need to pick up my skateboard off the public sidewalk and walk by his house because it annoyed him. I was nine, nine years old. So when we were moving, on the last night I tied this guy's garden hose to his mailbox. I tied the other end to his car's rear bumper. At 7.30 in the morning, I heard this odd engine reverend, then some sort of crunch of wood, then glass shatter. Apparently, instead of just ripping his mailbox from his front yard, the garden hose acted like a bungee and pulled the box out and flung it at his rear car window. Glass everywhere. The police showed up. And when they questioned me, I blinked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am nine years old. I am child. It must have been the bad kids. Thank you, Mr. Prober. Don't F with the Powell Peralta kid. At one point in time, the house next door became an unlicensed, I'm sure of it, assisted living facility for mentally challenged teens and adults. The nurses or workers didn't do a very good job keeping an eye on them. There were multiple times when one guy would jump the wood privacy fence and creep around our backyard or just be running through the street at two in the morning, screaming. I almost hit him with my car once backing out of my driveway. Felt bad for everyone, but it was disturbing if he didn't know he was there and all of a sudden caught a glimmer of light from his eyes when looking outside from the patio sliding door. We were very worried he might accidentally drown in our pool. Did everything to make sure the doors were secure for the screened-in patio. One had my fair share of neighbors over the years, but none quite as peculiar and unsettling as the one who lived right next door. There were not one but two distinct incidents that firmly earned her the title of creepy neighbor. 
The first peculiar encounter occurred when she decided to rescue my cat. Now, I should mention that my cat was perfectly fine, and it was a sunny day outside. But my neighbor, for reasons only she understood, deemed it necessary to save my feline companion because it looked cold. She stealthily snatched up my unsuspecting cat and spirited it away to her house without a word to me or my family. For two long days, I searched frantically for my missing cat. Little did I know that the culprit behind its disappearance was the one living next door. It wasn't until after the cat's unauthorized two-day vacation in her home that she finally decided to inform us. I couldn't fathom her audacity in taking someone else's pet without their consent and then keeping it a secret for so long, all in the name of misguided good intention. The second unsettling incident involved my then fiancé, now my wife. My neighbor approached her one day wearing a sinister smile and casually inquired about the different girls that I had allegedly been bringing over. This was baffling because, in reality, there had been no other women aside from my loving fiancé. It was a bizarre and unwarranted accusation that left my wife feeling uncomfortable and me astounded by her audacity. And if these two incidents weren't enough to cement her reputation as the neighborhood oddity, there was the matter of her early morning yard work. She had a peculiar habit of trimming her bushes at 5.30 a.m., and for some inexplicable reason she decided that doing so in her bra was entirely acceptable. It was an image that I could never quite erase from my mind, and it sent shivers down my spine every time I caught a glimpse of it. I often found myself questioning her sense of boundaries and social norms. It was clear that she operated on a different wavelength, and her behavior from cat napping to baseless accusations and early morning gardening attire left an indelible mark in my memory. To this day, she remains the benchmark for the most peculiar and creepy neighbor I've ever had the misfortune of living next to. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.